Justice League Dark is a storyline that started around 2018 and basically featured Zatanna and Constantine creating a Justice League team to handle magic. Starts with Wonder Woman joining the team and it's one of my all-time favorites. I hope you guys enjoy today's full story. With the fall of the Source Wall, many of the heroes have begun to notice things in the world. Things that are changing. Things that were constants now becoming uncertainties. And Zatanna is about to learn just how the rules of magic are not like anything she once knew. As Zatanna performs her magical act, she reaches into her top hat stating the magical words, Tabar, Repa, Nita, and she pulls out a rabbit. As she does, she feels something wet, and she lifts the rabbit up to see that it's dead. Just then, the top hat begins to spin, and from inside of it, horrifying creatures, they begin to spring out. In the crowds, they begin to clap. Zatanna yells, No! This is not a part of the show! You need to! However, the creatures, as they reach out, they're grabbing people from their seats, dragging them into the hat. Before anyone could be pulled away, though, Diana, Wonder Woman, jumps down, smashing the hat and the creature, stating that she believes that this is why most magicians have assistance. Zatanna asks, why is she here? And Diana tells her because she hasn't returned her call since Kalu. Zatanna then says, well, the show isn't over yet. Nrab! And as Zatanna tries to use her magic to burn the creature, it instead begins to spit fire into the crowd. Diana watches, stating great hair. It's turning your own spells back against you. You have to stop, Zatanna. Zatanna shudders, stating that she doesn't have any other way to get it away from these people. Trosia too! But rather than wires shorting out, the creatures begin to spray sparks onto the people, and Diana says that it would seem that they need a more physical approach. As Diana charges in, Zatanna notices a lighter on the ground that someone dropped when escaping. Diana grabs onto one of the tendrils, and as she grips it, it turns into ash. She asks if the magic is working again, and Zatanna holding out her magic hat as it burns, telling her no. And as for the question after, it's still no. Diana then says why. This theory to belong to her father before he passed. He was looking for the same answers as her. Why don't they work together? Wonder Woman and Zatanna. Zatanna tells her she doesn't understand this world its rules or its people. She has nothing but respect for the League, but her answer hasn't changed. Diana looks around, stating that she nearly killed an entire audience with a spell that she used to be able to control in her sleep. Magic is broken. You cannot fix it alone, Zatanna. However, as Zatanna declines Diana's invitation once again, she turns her to another place that she may be able to get answers. The Winter's Gate Manor. Just before Zatanna walks in, a voice from the shadows state that they heard that she learned a new trick with a top hat. Zatanna looks back at Constantine, lighting his cigarette, and as he exhales, he tells her that he is dying to see it. Zatanna tells him that he really is a piece of crap, and Constantine says, I never claimed to be anything else. Find anything in Zatara's theater? Zatanna tells him no, and Constantine goes on stating that her magic has gone all haywire like all the others. Another backwards word, and there's no telling what horror awaits. All you have now are your wits and your will. It's time to decide where you stand. And Zatanna tells him that she firmly stands with magic. Constantine looks at the ground stating, Actually, you're on the sidewalk. And from what I understand, there's more than one option about who to take up arms with. Zatanna says that this is bigger than the Justice League, bigger than Wonder Woman understands. And as she turns away, she says that she thinks the magic users are going to lose. Constantine pulls out a cigarette telling her, I think the things are about to change. I know I can handle myself, but can they? Meanwhile, at the Oblivion Bar, somewhere just outside of reality, Diana sits with her drink, and Bobo the Detective Chimp asks, So, you want to buy a chimp a drink? Diana says that she doesn't understand. She's asked all of the major magical players, people that she's trusted her life with, in crisis after crisis, and one by one they have all turned her down. Bobo takes a sip from his glass, stating, oh, Maybe they don't like you. And Diana hangs her head, stating that perhaps he's right. Bobo tells her, it was a joke. You're a 10 foot tall supermodel action superhero goddess. Plenty of people like you. I was there when all of this started to go down and I can tell you it's a lot more complicated than it seems. I might be just an immortal crime solving primate with a magical bar that no one seems to come to anymore, but you work and operate in the gleaming ivory tower that literally glows. Down here in the weird shadows of the world, it's all a bit messier than that. Diana tells him, I've seen messy. But after the rise of the Tree of Wonder in Salem, magic has been out of balance. I've seen things that would make even your hair stand on end. I've connected it somehow, but I know I'm in over my head and I never once thought about turning back. Bobo tells Tracy, ah, give me two more drinks. And as the glasses start to fill themselves, Tracy smiles, stating, whatever you want, Nightmaster. Bobo shouts, damn it, I told you not to call me that. And Diana says, why did she? But Bobo says, I wasn't going to bring it up, but Jim owned this place. He's a stalwart in the magical community. That's why we all used to drink here. 
He also owned the Sword of Night that made him the Night Master, defender of a magical realm outside of time called Myra. He left it all to me. Bobo takes the sword out and drops it on the bar, stating, The people of Myra weren't very thrilled to hear a talking monkey. It's a great feeling. Bobo then puts on his cap and says, How about we talk about something more pleasant, something about dead bodies? Later, down in the Hall of Justice, Bobo walks by a giant skeletal dragon stating, Shush! The Justice League went all out with the Magic Justice League. And it's only you? Diana tells him not exactly. Kirk the Man Bat steps out shouting, Ha ha! You found another! Diana says that Bobo is just assisting at the moment, same as him. And Kirk laughs, Ha ha! Yeah, once I saw this place, I knew I had to set up my lab and I couldn't leave. Bobo whispers asking, Is that a Man Bat to the Batman bad guy? And Diana says that Kirk is working with the government to make amends for his misdeeds. Kirk goes on stating that the bodies that they have been working with are wildly fascinating. He hasn't been able to turn away. Their genetic structure has been altered by the opposing energy. He's not sure what to call it. Dark energy, anti-energy, make sure it's truly his and call it Langstrom energy. Haha, <laughs> but then again, he's already known for a trademark formula. Or two. Meanwhile, over in Salem, Swamp Thing sits and watches the Tree of Wonder, attempting to communicate with it. And after a while, Zatanna walks behind him, stating it's hard to imagine something so beautiful could be causing so much damage. Swamp Thing tells her, It's not the Kosh. It's only the bridge. It's not meant to last. It was meant to be a cosmic beacon to measure the life force of our world. But now it is seeing that it can become something else. I thought I could speak to it and it would care to listen. Satana tells him that she's angry. She thought she could find the answers in her father's old books. Some genius trick that he had up his sleeve so that she could get her magic back. And Swamp Thing then says, The tree has an answer. It told me when you asked me. It wishes to speak with you. As everything begins to fade to black, Zatanna then asks what's going on. And as a brilliant flame ignites, an image of Zatara appears over the fire. Her father. He says, I'm sorry, but this is only the beginning. They are coming. This is what I've trained you for ever since you were a child. This is the end that I feared would come. The original owners of magic are returning. The old order will not be able to stand in their way. The darkness that destroyed me is only a sliver of their power. It will infect the earth with horror and burn out all living things. There is one who may be able to fight the power back, but it is far more likely that they will only hasten the end. You must find him. The other kind can see us. The upside down man is nearly here. Zatanna shouts that she doesn't understand, and then a figure asks, Is it inside of her? I will eat them all and find out. Zatanna begins to scream in pain as the vision starts to become twisted as Swamp Thing calls out to her, Hang on. But back underneath the Hall of Justice, Bobo examines one of the cadavers that Diana brought in while Kirk goes on explaining that these bodies are infected with some kind of extra-dimensional decay. But then there's a rumble and Bobo asks, does the dragon in the lobby snore? And Kirk says, not that I know of. Bobo then says, okay, things are about to get very bad. Just then the mouth of one of the cadavers jolts out trying to bite Bobo and soon all of the bodies begin to get up from their examination tables. Kirk looks around stating that this shouldn't be possible. They are completely inert on a cellular level. And Bobo tells him that he's pretty sure that they are a few miles past science, Doc. Diana tells Kirk that they might need something a bit more threatening, and Kirk injects himself with a needle that he has, stating that he has a batch of the classic formula with him now. Kirk then shrieks, fully transforming into the man bat, and Diana calls out to Kirk to get Bobo out of here. If she is to fail, she will fail alone. But with a loud crack of vine shooting out of the ground, and a woman's voice tells her that she is not alone. They will fight this together. Diana looks back to see Zatanna and Swamp Thing asking, What are you doing here? And Zatanna goes on telling her, This is much worse than anyone thought. Magic is going to die and all of humanity is going to die with it. And one of us will bring its destruction. As Diana listens to Zatanna's words, she thinks back to just before she turned 12 and how she wondered about the great secrets of the world. One night, as she was about to learn about Themyscira's greatest secret, the nine Cthulian witch women that walked each hunter's moon. Her mother Hippolyta forbade her from asking the question, so it was time for her to find out about those women herself. She creeped into the shadows and what she saw she could not possibly understand. The witch women were dancing and singing three and three and three, and as they seemed to dance, their bodies merged. Their limbs contorted with every syllable in their chant, Hecate, 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 Hecate. And from the cauldron before them, a being rose and all at once the witch women turned to see her. The being from the cauldron told the witch women to bring her to them and Diana tried to escape, but she was captured. The being held a brand above Diana's forehead and then marked her as she screamed. Back in the current times, Diana punches through another flesh creature telling Bobo that they're going to need something stronger. Watch her back and Bobo swings the sword of night asking, Are you kidding? I barely know how to even hold this thing! The five continue fighting, giving Kirk the time to rip the bodies apart and Diana the room to beat it to a pulp. And as the last of them fall, Diana holds out a deep breath and then turns to Zatanna, grabbing her coat, demanding that she explain. 
She said the humankind stole magic and that its owners are coming back and that one of them is going to bring an end to the world itself. Swamp Thing reaches out with his vines to stop Diana, stating, That is enough. Zatanna came here to bring you the very answers that you seek. Diana asks, I came to each of you and you rejected me. Now you wish to work together? Zatanna says of their community, Magic doesn't care much for outside meddling, but it's going to need it. She just received an apocalyptic warning from her dead father. He showed her a vision of the five of them and said that one of them would be the key to magic survival or its end. Diana tells her, with all due respect, the last time you tried to use magic, it tried to kill you in a room full of bystanders. I was there to save your life. Swamp Thing then says, Zatanna came to save yours. And Diana lets go stating, I'm sorry, I've, I've just been frustrated. I'm exhausted and I desperately want answers. Boba looks up and see Kirk sitting in the rafters asking, does anyone have a spare vial of D-man batification on them? Or is we just gonna leave him like that? Later in Salem, the five make their way to the Tower of Fate, seeking the aid of Dr. Fate. Zatanna walks up to the doorless tower, shouting to Fate to let them in, and Kirk asks, So is this guy some kind of a wizard? Zatanna explains that Kent Nelson is the latest incarnation of Dr. Fate. He was given his powers by Naboo, one of the Lords of Order. With that power, he's probably the most powerful sorcerer on this level of reality. Just then a large unk appears, and Fate calls out, It is rare for me to have guests that I would welcome into my home. I pray that I have the answers that you are seeking. Swan Thing tells Zatanna, Something feels wrong with the Tree of Wonder. The same roots that touch the cadavers emanate from within. I must investigate. As the others step into the tower, Diana says that it's good to see him again. And Fate tells her, I'm not so sure. Magic is under assault, and I see that Zatanna has betrayed the trust of our community to seek out your help. Zatanna says that she's sorry, but the answers that they need won't come from him. They must speak with the original Lord of Order himself. They must speak with Naboo. Fate tells her, very well, but these subjects are too important for the ears of laymen and outsiders. Our guests will remain here. Diana and Zatanna pass through the portal, and Kirk and Bobo stand there, and Kirk says, Well, that was rude. Back outside, Swamp Thing looks up at the Tree of Wonder, and a voice asks, Did you tell your super friends your secret yet? Or are you saving it for when they are really counting on you? Swamp Thing tells Constantine, I do not have time to humor you. And Constantine then says, I was expecting you to have a longer run, honestly. Before you packed it in and joined the Parliament of the Trees, Guess I backed the wrong horse. Swamp Thing goes on stating, I've given much of myself and my life to this world, but yet it can still find ways to horrify and disappoint me. The green will be better served by a defender who is still rooted in this world. Constantine tells him, You've gone and done it, haven't you? This is the price, isn't it? Make sure this tree doesn't give you much more trouble. That way you can set your roots down in the plant element retirement village with the rest of your kind. Swamp Thing sits down telling him, You speak as if you know everything. And Constantine lights a cigarette, telling him, I know more than I should, that's for sure. Last time anything close to this happened, I knew we had someone to count on. The thing that's been killing everyone is coming here. You can feel it, right? Swamp Thing sighs, telling him, Of course, it's nearly here. Back inside of the tower, Diana tells Fate that they need Naboo's guidance. Please let them speak with them. They need to know how all of this horror has been set into motion. Fate says, Before I do, I must tell you a story. It was the dawn of man, primitive and wild. Man was scientists, explorers, philosophers. They wished to put the world in order in harmony with its own elements, like Prometheus. Like Prometheus, they found a power and they dragged it into this world to do their bidding, the first magic of this world. They were the lords of order, the great peacemakers, the sorcerer kings, the power was unspeakable. Our bodies could not hold it, so we bound ourselves to artifacts so that we could focus and contain it, prevent it from spreading. But it was too late. The power had been caught. Magic was spreading across the world like a disease. So we taught means to guide and control the magic through tools and language. Staff, wands, rules, counterbalances, the tools of the order. Together we wrote the first books of magic. We fooled ourselves into thinking it could benefit the world. But what do we see now? What's happening to all of these hedge witches and warlocks who have served an iota of the power of magic? They are finally tasting it to full. The pure primal void of possibility which instilled this world with magic. It has come to life and it has turned its gaze upon you. It is coming. Diana says that perhaps there is a way to stop it. We must speak to Naboo. People are dying. And fate tells her the earth has been sick for a long time. I'm afraid it's only scarcely begun. Out in the lobby, Bobo looks around at the backwards of room, stating that this place really gives him the willies. And Kurt notices a vase sitting on a stand. And on it, a person who looks like he's trying to escape. 
Kurt picks up the vase, holding it out to Bobo, asking if he can look at it, and without realizing it, he drops it, causing it to shatter. From the broken pieces, a bright light shines, and a young man materializes and is thrown out onto the floor. He shouts that his name is Khalid. He used to be Dr. Fate. Kate Nelson hasn't been in control of the helm or the tower for weeks. It's Nabu! Nabu is the one bringing the other kind in! But before he could finish, his mouth is sewn shut, and his body breaks into pieces and is reformed into the vase on the stand. Back with Diana and Zatanna. Zatanna asks if they can feel that something feels off. And Fate says, yes, I feel it. And it brings me great relief. It's time for the world to rid itself of magic. That's why after all of these millennia, I opened up the door to the other kind. Diana grabs her lasso, shouting, We aren't talking to Kent, are we? We're talking to Naboo. And Naboo tells her, You shouldn't have meddled in our world. I have great respect for you and the League. When this is done, you will see it is just. You will feel the order of things. Zatanna runs up, asking, What did you do to Kent? And Naboo throws her into a pillar, stating that Kent and his young protege lacked the stomach for what was necessary, just as you do. Disappointing. Your father raised you better than this. And just as a bolt of black lightning strikes the ground and everything begins to fade, Diana sees a pair of legs walking towards her. For the second time in her life, she stood frozen at the face of true horror, and she wanted to scream. The upside down man looks at the two of them asking, which will I eat first? The upside down man looks at them, yes, stand back, that's appropriate. You may call me the upside down man if you'd like. Or perhaps you'd rather just scream. Individual form is so tentative, isn't it? An agreement of flesh and bones, suggesting something more. I do hope that I've arranged the limbs correctly. This is all new to me. The upside down man looks around asking, Where is the one who opened the door for us? The one in the shiny helmet. Did you kill him and steal his power? Diana tells him that this is not who they are. The upside down man says, of course it is! Your kind is nothing but thieves and killers. We've been watching you for years. The upside down man holds out his arm, and the black tendrils rise on the ground, grabbing the two of them with Zatanna, shouting, asking, What are you? And the upside down man says, Horror itself. You forgot to fear the darkness. We are here to remind you of us. Just then, something cuts down into the upside down man, and Kurt holding Bobo fly through, with Bobo stating, I'll pass on that. As the upside down man's body reforms itself, he laughs, telling Bobo, Hurrah, <laughs> you've seen so much! You held the knowledge of creation in the tiny skull of yours! Bobo is picked up by one of his legs, by the tendrils, stating, Three feet eight inches proud, you weird thing! Also, we should kill this thing before it talks to me again. But the upside down man holds his hands together, stating, You cannot kill a horror, little one! And Bobo's body begins to liquefy. His body spreads out onto the floor like a giant puddle, with Kirk running over, holding the vase with Khalid, scooping Bobo up into it, stating, I can fix you! Science! Science can fix you! Diana shouts for him to get back, but as a portal opens up, sucking them all out, a large pair of red eyes looks through, and a voice shouts, Enough! Swamp Thing stands over the tower, stating, I will not let you hurt the world like this! The Upside Down Man says, Let me! An odd expression, and as soon as the Upside Down Man touches Swamp Thing's leg, his entire body begins to decay and a wither. As Swamp Thing's massive body crashes down, Diana jumps past Constantine telling him to get away. And Constantine tells her, Sorry, love, but this thing just battered away an elemental guardian, met a demon in the wrong end of Prague a few weeks ago, told me that he had a sigil that could kill a god, but he wasn't very good at cards, was he? Constantine begins to create the demon sigil, and as Zatanna watches, she shouts, You're going to kill yourself! Your body can't handle that level of magic! Constantine falls deeper into his sigil, and Zatanna calls out to him that he needs to let go, and as the explosion goes off, the light of the sigil fades, and Constantine falls to the ground, telling Zatanna, If you could, grab my smokes. They're in my jacket pocket. Zatanna runs over, asking, How stupid was that? You had no control over that kind of spell, even with your demon blood. The upside down man walks up, stating, You are but children. Would you attempt to throw a bucket of ocean water into a tsunami? There's no hope for you. You stole from us, and now you will be punished. You and your entire world. The upside down man holds out his hand, lifting Constantine into the air, stating, you have some magical blood, don't you? Let's see how you fare without it. He claps, and at that very moment, the demon blood inside of Constantine begins to separate itself from his body, ripping itself out of his very pores. Satana yells, Oh, yeah, yawa! And the upside down man looks back, smiling, Oh, you're just as tedious as your father. We enjoyed playing with him all of those years ago, taking him apart and putting him back together. Elias, yeah, I am! He shouts over and over. 
Despair begins to come over Zatanna. The upside down man opens his mouth stating, you can join me if you wish. As a blast of energy leaves the upside down man's mouth, Diana runs in blocking it with her shield shouting, no! The upside down man stares at Diana and he says, curious, what kind of creature are you? Diana tells him that she is Diana, Princess of Themyscira, daughter of Zeus, this world's protector, and I will not let you harm another soul. The upside down man holds out his arm and he pulls back as if he's going to pull off the blanket of reality, stating, That's not what I mean. I don't care who you are. I just want to know what you are. There's something strange inside of you, something that I do not understand. The upside down man then touches her forehead, stating, This, this is the font of power, and it's foreign, but I can turn it on. Suddenly, light shines from Diana as she screams, and the mark from where she was branded appears. She falls to her knees as her hair turns white, asking, What is this? And Zatanna says that she isn't sure, but whatever it is, it is hurting the upside down man. Diana shouts, I don't understand what's happening. It's as if my veins are filled with a burning light. I feel so much power. I have never felt this before. Zatanna takes her hand, stating that she must clear her mind, focus her intent. What does she want? Diana says that she wants these creatures to go back from where they came, and Zatanna tells her, Good. Now hold that thought and repeat after me. I should nab your mouth, Mufia. The upside down man begins to yell no, and soon after Diana repeats the words that Zatanna told her. The loud explosion goes off, lighting the entire sky, and with it, everything reverts to how it was. Constantine begins to sit up, and Bobo is restored to his original form, and the green returns to Swamp Thing. The upside down man tells them, You've only delayed the inevitable, but I must say, this has made it far more interesting. Soon the light will begin to fade, and along with it, the Upside Down Man. As Diana falls to the ground, Zatanna runs over stating that she's out cold. The mark on her forehead has faded away. Bobo asks, So, uh, did we win? And Zatanna tells him, The most powerful sorcerer in existence just sold out their world to a predatory entity made of pure magic. The only thing that looks like it can stop it is a desecratingly powerful light trapped inside of our friend's head. A power that she has never seen nor felt in all of her years of study. So no, Bobo. I'm afraid this is only the beginning. For the Amazons of Themyscira, they would often feel something pulling on their hearts as the moonlit shadows grew each night. It was something that they could not explain, like some cosmic thing that was warning them that there is something to fear in the dark. Many years ago, the young Diana felt just that, but instead of pulling the covers over her face, she went out. What she found was something so horrible that she couldn't comprehend it. She wanted to scream, but no sounds left her lips, only a hoarse, rasping voice. She wished that she could unsee what was just seen, but it was too late. The witching hour was upon us. As the mangled bodies of the witches of Hecate chased her, they pinned her down so that the witch goddess herself could do what she wanted. And Diana could feel the arcane energy of the branding iron getting close to her, and she screamed as it was pushed down on her forehead. When it was all done, she ran to her mother's bedside to tell her everything that she could remember, and the queen wasted no time bringing her tormentors to the palace. The witches said that it is true that they serve Hecate, the triple goddess of witchcraft, and each month they walk to the old crossroads in the forest to perform their rites to their patron. There are secrets in those rites, but no menace. In all of their years, they've never witnessed such horrors like the ones that the princess speaks of. They hope that their patron hears their prayers, but she has always been with them in spirit, not body. When they found the young princess asleep in a tree above their ceremony, they thought it best to return her to her bed without waking her. As Diana reached womanhood, they would be glad to teach her anything she wishes to know of their ways. They only need to call upon them. Hippolyta looks at her daughter and asks if that satisfies her, and Diana laughs, stating it does. She's terribly sorry for the trouble that she has caused them. From that night on, she would sleep soundly, but once Diana was taken away, Hippolyta shouted and demanded, asking what have they done with her daughter. The witches tell her that they would never, but Hippolyta shouts that she heard their bedtime story, and she appreciates them comforting Diana. But she will not ask again. Their queen commands them to speak. In unison, the three witches become calm and the triple goddess Hecate herself appears. She whispers quietly, you will forget all of this into Hippolyta's ear, and the three witches quickly fall to their knees, bowing, stating that she has come. They called for her under many moons and feared their offerings were not enough to please her. Her eyes glow purple, and she smiles, telling them they were not. The witches begin to feel something inside of them, and as their bodies turn to sand, she tells them that her time draws closer, and soon she will call upon her true children, her witch-marked. 
At long last, the world will feel her fury. As lightning strikes over the Hall of Justice, in the current day, Diana tells the League that the magic as they know it has been destroyed, and the foe that they faced, well, show them, Zatanna. Zatanna places her hands on the table, stating that it isn't safe for her to use the usual brand of magic, so forgive her that her ruin work is a little bit rusty. As she begins to draw her ruin, a bright light shines from it as the projection of the Upside Down Man appears, and Diana says that the Upside Down Man is the tip of the spear, a singular being in a race of cosmic horrors known as the Other Kind. He was able to destroy Swamp Thing with a mere gesture. He turned Detective Chimp into a puddle of flesh, and he effortlessly ripped the demon blood out of John Constantine's body. They managed to save their friends and drive the creature back, but the other kind's powers seemed to be unlimited. Batman then asks, what about the magical heavy hitters? We should call Jason Blood and... Satana stops him, stating that Jason Blood and the others of the magical community have swore off helping the Justice League. They wish to solve this problem themselves. Superman then asks, what of Dr. Fate? Why isn't he helping your cause? And Diana explains that Dr. Fate is the one who guided the creatures here. Kent Nelson is trapped within the helmet, and Naboo is tired of the chaos caused by magic, and he seeks to end it. Dr. Fate is the other threat that they wanted to speak of, mainly because he tried to feed them to the Upside Down Man. Superman pauses for a moment and asks, you managed to fight this creature back? And Diana tells him yes. So then he stares at Diana asking, how? She thinks back to the power that she unleashed, and she says that they were just lucky. They can't rely on that happening again. She'll work with her team to develop the next steps and report back. Martian Manhunter tells her that they have their thanks. If they could, they would like Zatanna to stay for a moment. As Diana gets ready to set foot in the door, she looks back and Zatanna tells them, sure. Once she leaves, Zatanna tells Batman that she really wishes they hadn't done that. Diana still hasn't forgiven her for siding with the magical community at the beginning of all of this. And Batman says that he has seen Diana stare down gods and battle horrors. He's never seen her like this before. Something about this threat is under her skin. We've known each other for a long time, and I know that there's something that you're not telling me, but I need to know. Are you up for this? Satana tells him that she hopes so. She really, really hopes so. And as she leaves, Batman looks back at everyone and says, Okay, who else is concerned? As Zatanna catches up to Diana, she asks when exactly did she decide to not tell them about the unknown, the unspeakable, the powerful source of magic trapped within her head. Diana looks at her own reflection in a mirror, and she says that until they understand what the mark is, she's not going to concern the lead. She also doesn't want them to rely on something inside of her that she cannot control. This mark, she can recall an echo of a nightmare from when she was a child, but how is that possible? As the two leave, Hecate's face appears in the mirror, and she turns towards the doorway leading to the Justice League meeting room. Inside, Flash says, Okay, I for one am scared out of my mind. I'm not going to get sleep for like a week. And Hot Girl says that she can't think of a single lifetime that she has ever liked magic. It's always the end of the world and horrible monsters. But just then, Hecate appears, and she whispers into everyone's ears, You will forget all of this. As she fades, Martian Manhunter says, Yes, where were we? Ted Cord has registered another complaint. Meanwhile, over at the Oblivion Bar, the witches of the Sisterhood of the Sleight of Hand gather around for a night of fun and laughter. The girls meet up every so often to encourage one another, even the ones who know only the minor crafts. But tonight, the air is thick with power, and even Constantine, who knows why he's here, feels it. Then Rebecca Carstairs, the one known as Witchfire, walks in. Once everyone has their drinks in their hand, Tracy 13 calls out to everyone. All right, I call this meeting of the Midnight Society to order. For those who know me and those who don't, my name is Tracy 13. And in these troubled times, I am your sister. We're going to have an invocation tonight and to find protection against the threat looming over magic kind. So please take each other's hands. Just then, Witchfire feels something and she sees something from her childhood. A brand. She drops her glass and her skin turns white and Hecate's brand appears on her forehead and she tells everyone to run. Please run! Through her body, Hecate speaks, telling them that they invoke her name and her power. Yet they waste it on idle fantasies. They have forgotten the triple goddess that they serve. The world of magic will has failed me and I will burn it out and create something new in its place. I have no use for you! Witchfire's body ignites, spreading fire throughout the entire Oblivion Bar. Some witches manage to escape, but others are not so fortunate. But meanwhile, down on the Hall of Justice, Diana gathers her team, stating that they need to find answers and a fast. Take the opportunity that they have before the other can break through and... But just then, a voice calls out to Diana, whispering to her, Remember. 
Diana struggles stating no, and then images of her childhood flash before her eyes, and the brand begins to shine. Just as before, white hair and white skin, Diana says that she can feel her. Zatanna runs over telling her to just remain calm. She has powered through this before. She can do it again. Hecate then appears above everyone and tells Zatanna that no, she cannot. Detective Chimp points up asking, anyone else see that there? Or is my drink much stronger than it tasted? Hecate stares at Zatanna asking, do you know who I am? And Zatanna kneels down, stating, yes, she is Hecate, the goddess of magic. Her father taught her to pay homage to her. Hecate says, I rather liked your father, but he was short-sighted. All of your kind is. Bobo runs over to the computer to try and contact the League, but Hecate pulls him back, stating, no one will hear you now. The mundane world will be blind to my magic until my work is done. Bobo calls out to Zatanna to hurry up and get them out of here, and Zatanna tells him that her magic is dangerous. If she speaks, she could free the other kind. So Bobo shouts, how come one magic person on our team can't do freaking magic? All right, all right, okay, thinking. Swampy, get us in the closet now. Swamp Thing uses his husks to slow down Hecate, and he grabs everyone and he runs over to the closet door. Hecate tells Diana that she is witch marked. Her power is lane safe, hidden within her since childhood, and she needs it back. Everyone crashes through the closet door, with Zatanna asking, you put a door in your bar to the Hall of Justice? Bobo tips his hat, stating, It seemed like a good idea at the time, and clearly it was! Destroy the door! Swamp Thing crushes it with his vines, and Kirk Langston sighs, stating, I could go for a beer right now. He opens up the cellar door, and he looks out, stating, Oh, no, no, no. The charred bodies of the Sisterhood of the Slight Hand Witches lay scattered, with Constantine sitting in the bar. Satana asks if it's him, and he looks back, getting up, and kisses her. She pulls herself back, asking, Why did you do that? And Constantine tells her, Is it an obvious, love? Look around. This is my last chance. The witching hour has begun, and we're all about to die. Later, out on the waters, Bobo tells everyone, We're all coming up to the island. Brace yourselves. There's no telling how weird things are going to get. Says the talking chimp driving a boat full of monsters. Swamp Thing looks down at the knocked out unicorn asking, Do we really need to offer this to her? What is she going to do to the poor thing? Kirk tells him, I'm pretty sure none of us want to know the answer to that one. And Diana sits in the front of the boat as they approach Athea, watching as they get closer. Satana tells everyone that they need to be careful with how they go about this. There's no telling what you know who is going to throw at them. Hell, there's a good chance that she already knows and she's waiting to spring a trap. Zatanna heads to the front telling the same thing to Diana, but Diana jumps over the edge, swimming to the shore, stating, The time for waiting has passed. No matter what horrors lie on this island, they must face them if they are to have any hope. Zatanna calls out for her to wait. Don't say it! Don't say her! But without listening, Diana says it. Cersei. The clouds in the sky begin to swirl, and there's a loud crack of boom as lightning strikes down. And suddenly, everyone begins to change into animals, including Bobo. Cersei appears shouting, You dare! You dare face me in my place of power! With a single gesture, I could have my companions feasting on your fetid meat on the jagged rock face. I welcome whatever madness drove you to my domain. Have you anything to say for yourself, idiot child? Diana raises up her tiara showing the Witchmark brand. She says, Cersei, we need help. Cersei looks at it and says, no, the Witchmark of Hecate, you've been marked. She quickly reverts her spells and changes to normal clothes, stating, you'll have to forgive me for the theatrics. I'm a few thousand years old and I do enjoy playing with the heroes quite a bit. Silly outfits, the punching it, it all keeps things from getting tedious. But this is no time for such things. The witching hour has begun. She hugs Diana and says that she is so, so sorry. It's going to get much worse from here. Over in New Mexico, though, Hecate's call reaches another child, Manitou Dawn. Hecate told her where she needed to go, and without saying a word, Manitou leaped into the air. Back on the island, Cersei welcomes everyone into her home, and Bobo looks at the glass, with Cersei telling him that that wine is from California. She did not touch it. However, she can't get over the fact that they brought her an actual unicorn. What on earth is she going to do with an actual unicorn? She realized that's what she makes her billionaire clients do to prove that they're worth her time, right? Diana folds her arms, stating that this is all far from the point. We appreciate your hospitality, but we've come seeking information. This is not a time for a drink or reverie. We need to understand what we are facing. We need to know what this mark on my forehead is and what Hecate hopes to accomplish. Hecate is her patron. Cersei tells her patron isn't the word that she would use. The relationship has always been far darker than that. Allow her to try and explain. Before the gods first walked the earth, before all of the pantheons of the cultures of the world, there was Hecate. She was the primal woman incarnate, maidenhood to motherhood, to crone, birth, creation, death, all of it. 
Her symbol was the full moon, the symbol of mankind's great collective unconsciousness. She represented nature itself and the potential of nature. They would come to call her the triple goddess of magic, the witch mother. In the early days of man, when she still consorted with an open heart and mind, they were the first magicians attempting to steal the unlimited power within her. To protect her countless power from the growing darkness, she broke it into five pieces and hid it within five young women until the hour came that she could take that power back. As those women lived and died, she would rehouse it, never taking the power back into herself. And since the early days of man, there have always been five of the witch marked. Few have ever understood the power hidden within themselves, and fewer still have ever wielded that power. The power itself is corrosive. It's too much for the human soul to bear. Should they activate it, she would be capable of controlling her witch mark like puppets. Understand this, as each of her witch marks activate, she will grow more powerful. For centuries, she hated what magic has become on this world. And from what you have told me about the other kind and the upside down man, she fears that that time has come. She will burn out the hearts of magic and replace them with her own power. If she succeeds, she will control all of magic like she can control her witch mark and prevent the other kind from ever crossing over. Understand this too. Hecate may have once represented something light in the world, but she has become a twisted force of hate. With all of the power that I wield, I am nothing in the face of what Hecate is capable of. There is no power in the world that could stop her. Diana asks, what about if her own power was used against her? When the Upside Down Man activated her mark, she had some control over it. Perhaps her magic could do the same. Cersei thinks about it and says that that is a very interesting question. It could work. Zatanna slams her hands on the table shouting, how could you even consider this? Batman was right, maybe you aren't up for this. Diana stands up yelling that that is enough. There is a power inside of her capable of ripping this world apart and their enemies wish to use her for that. If there is any way that she can control it, then by the fate she will do it. Diana turns to Cersei and asks, could you activate the mark in such a way that it would shield me from Hecate's control? There must be something that can be done. Cersei tells her, yeah, she can whip up something as Zatanna yells for Diana to just stop and listen to yourself. Diana waves her off, stating that she is done listening, and Cersei begins to cast her magic, telling Diana that this is going to sting just a bit. But before the spell could go off, Deadman phases through the ceiling, shouting, finally, there you idiots are. By the way, do you know that there's a really nervous unicorn running around upstairs? Constantine looks at Deadman asking, what's wrong? And Deadman explains, the Ramakushna has sent me to get help. Heard that there's a new Justice League Dark or something. Right now, Nanda Parbat is burning down, and if we don't stop Manitao Dawn, she'll tear it down. Manitao is wielding a power that I've never seen before. Everything that we throw at it just bounces off. This is some kind of magic hooey that makes me feel like I'm still some hick carny out of my depth. Bobo says, well, unfortunately, we're all getting pretty used to that feeling about this point. Dead man then goes on telling him, yeah, well, I'm all ears. Something has to be done. Diana calls out to him, stating, don't worry, there is. And she steps forward with her witch mark activated, and Cersei smiling. Diana then turns away from the others with a flick of her wrist. A hole into reality opens up, taking them all from one end of the world to the other. This is what terrified Zatanna the most. So much power wielded without a thought, and every magician knows that with all great magic comes a great cost. Everyone begins to step through the portal, but Zatanna, she walks in with caution. Seconds later, the others find themselves standing at the foot of Nandapar Bat, just in time to watch it burn, and at the very top, Manitao is reaching into the ancient stone walkways, ripping ripping them apart, laying waste to everything in sight. The dead men, Nanda Parbat's last line of defense, have separated from their hosts, and they are piled into Manitao to try and stop her, but with a simple get out, all of the dead men are expelled. As Manitao finishes, she looks back at the temple, and Ramakushna looks at Hecate and asks, why do you seek destruction? I have guarded the boundary of life and death for generations. I have never meddled in your affairs. Hecate rises up stating, yes, and you've done a poor work of it. Humankind sits at the precipice of destruction and magic, and it has become a liability. I will burn it all and replace it with something better. Hecate then points to Ramakushna, telling Manitao to show her their power. Manitao then gathers her strength and releases a powerful blast of energy aimed right at Ramakushna. At the last second, a pair of stone arms go up protecting Ramakushna, and as they crumble away, Diana walks through calling out to Hecate. Hecate sees her and tells her, you dare and try to use my power against me. Diana calls out to her, I did not call for this gift. However, I will use whatever weapon the gods have willed upon me. 
As the two get ready for their battle, Deadman flies up telling Ramakushna that they have to get her out of here, and she asks what of their home. Deadman says, this place, it's just brick and mortar. The rest is a metaphor. We can get that crap anywhere. Ramakushna tells him that she's not sure, and Deadman says, you gave me a second chance. Now allow me to help you. I've been at this game for a long time. All we need is a corporeal form, and we can get you out of here. Ramakushna looks at the monk host for her dead men, stating, These will do for now. As Zatan and the others help the monks up, Constantine asks, How much you want to bet the entire structural integrity of this place is about to fall? Swamp Thing jumps over the ledge as his vines spread out, and he says, I can bind it for now. Just allow me a moment. Dead man then tells Zatanna that they need to figure out a way to get out of here, and Bobo says, I, uh, I might be able to help with that if I remember how to use this damn sword. Ramakushna says that that is the sword of night, and he is the night master. And Bobo tells her, yeah, sure, something like that, and he swings the sword. A portal begins to open up, and Zatanna tells everyone to hurry up and get through it. Diana will kill us if any of us get incinerated by her crossfire. As everyone begins to pass through, Dead Man says that he really hopes to hell that she knows what she's doing. And Zatanna tells him, yeah, me too. Dead Man then says that just to be clear, I'm saying that just because it's damn clear that she has no freaking idea what she's doing with that power. And Zatanna tells him, point taken, now go. Back in the center of the city, Diana flies around fighting back both Hecate and Manitou. But Hecate calls out to Swamp Thing asking, can you feel it yet? Other things are happening. Swamp Thing pauses for a moment and then shouts, no, you can't do this. Elsewhere, before the Parliament of the Trees, Black Orchid stands before them, having her witch mark activated. Diana yells to Hecate, asking, What have you done? And Hecate tells her, I carried a piece of your soul, you and your sisters, and we've created a brave new world. Diana charges in, asking, Where have you sent the others? And as she attacks, Hecate shouts in pain. She holds out her hand, stating that she has had enough of these games. She will not wield her power against her. You are witch smart, and you will obey. Hecate hits Diana with a blast from her eye, sending Diana bouncing across the stone floor. As Zatanna rushes over, shouting to Diana, asking if she's okay, Hecate tells her, Diana is more than okay. She is what she is meant to be. Constantine sighs, oh, bloody hell. And Diana stands back up with Hecate telling her, kill them. And Diana says, yes, witch mother. But truth be told, Diana blinks her eyes, waking up in a pretty crazy place, void of all color. She gasps as she is lifting herself out of the puddles that she is laying in, and a voice tells her that they were wondering when she would get up. Diana asks who, and the woman flicks her lighter, and she says that, She's no one, really, at least not anymore. As Witchfire lights her cigarette, Diana asks how. They were told that she died with the Sisterhood of the Slight Hand, and Witchfire tells her. That's a much nicer way to say you burned all those nice girls. Diana gets up stating that she was fighting Manitou at Nanda Parbat, and then there was Black Orchid. What's going on? Witchfire says that this is where Hecate keeps them. The parts of their minds that she doesn't want getting away. Those two, though, they're still grounded, still caught up there in all the action. Diana then asks, what is this place? And Witchfire points up, stating that she should recognize the view. Diana turns and looks up and sees the earth and says, Great Hera. And Witchfire laughs, telling her that she wouldn't recommend invoking a goddess of the Greek pantheon here. This one isn't the real moon, not the literal ball of rock that you and your friends in the Justice League blew up. Think of this place as a metaphor representing the moon. Diana yells at their must be a way out of this place in which fire shrugs stating that I'm dead. I'm not going anywhere and neither are you. Them mortals don't really stand any chance, but perhaps a demigod could cause some problems, which is why we're here in the collective unconsciousness. Just then Diana falls to her knees asking why does she suddenly feel so weak? And Witchfire says that it's probably her body doing whatever Hecate is needing it to do. And back in the real world, Diana is continuing her rampage with Constantine lighting up asking, Can you feel it? The rules of magic are being changed right beneath our feet. Hecate is rewriting them in her own language, and Diana is little more than just a pen. There's a pub around the corner where I grew up. Always imagined that that's where I would go if any real apocalypse hit. Get a little drunk while the world falls apart. Zatanna smacks the back of Constantine's head, telling him, Just shut up! I have enough to worry about without your self-loathing crap. You're John freaking Constantine! You've given the finger to the devil himself. Stop acting like you can't do this. I just need the clever jackass that I know you are. Constantine begins to cough, and as he pulls the handkerchief away, there's a small amount of blood, and Constantine says, Ah, uh, there's something we need to talk about, love. I went to the doctor the other day, and it wasn't looking good. Not sure if it was the demon blood keeping me stitched up, or maybe the upside down man left me a little surprised. But this is not the kind of cancer you can do much to fight. Why do you think I was here in the bar when it burned inside out? Everything that made me halfway useful was tied to that blood. You want John freaking Constantine? Well, he's not here. 
Just another back alley exorcist with a bloody cough. Zatanna's smile stating, actually, it's funny you mention that. I have a friend who could use an exorcism right about now. Constantine laughs. <laughs> Bugger me, you're right. It has no chance of working, but it's better than a pint in a song. Meanwhile, over at the Oblivion Bar, everyone stumbles out of the portal, and Ramakushna shouts that she can feel it. The green, it is screaming. Kirk looks at Bobo and asks, Maybe we shouldn't have come here. What is this place that you mentioned? Myra? And Bobo says, Yeah, it's not a good idea. These folks aren't big fans of me. Don't think that they would like me bringing a magical war to their doorstep. Anyway, since this whole thing is terrifying and all, who else needs a drink? Just then a voice shouts, There will be no revelry. The Witch Mother has commanded your lives to end and Manitou Dawn will obey. Manitou follows everyone through the portal and as she crosses a black shadow reaches out grabbing her. She struggles asking what are these shadows and a voice from the shadows tell her that they are from the shadow dimension, a hellscape devoid of light. It also happens to be the place where the most powerful of them can escape when she massacred their friends. Tracy 13 shouts that this is the sisterhood of the slight hand and she really hopes this hurts. Back in Nanda Parbat, Satana runs up to Diana calling out to her telling her please listen I know there's still good inside Side of you. Diana turns back and stares, and Zatanna tells her that she knows that she's scared, that she's being forced to do all of this, but Wonder Woman, the Wonder Woman beneath the witch mark is stronger. Through Diana, Hecate speaks and tells her, Zatanna, you are nothing more than a cheap stage magician and fool. Diana cannot hear you through the tempest of my power. You do not deserve to live. Zatanna laughs, telling her, I figured that there would be something like that that you would say. Tempest of power or not, even a cheap magician knows that sleight of hand isn't about what you're looking at. It's about what you have missed. Suddenly, Hecate's powers begin to separate from Diana, and Hecate shouts that she can't move. Constantine says, It's a nice thing about a simple spell that scales easily. Tap a binding spell into the raw energy of a dying heart of magic, and you got yourself a party. Now then, Hecate, triple goddess, moonborn, queen of magic, release these women. The magic of Earth compels you! Diana begins to scream, and shortly afterwards, Black Orchid and Manitou begin to follow, and Diana says that she can feel it, the power. And back in the collective unconsciousness, Diana screams in pain there as well, with Witchfire sighing, stating those idiots. Diana rolls around screaming in pain, stating that it is excruciating. And what's more, Black Orchid and Manitou begin to scream until their bodies fade out of this place. Witchfire says they did it. They actually freed them. She hurries over to Diana, asking if she can hear her. Can she still feel the pain? And Diana groans, stating, no. It's like burning flesh. For a moment, she was back, and she was looking through her own eyes. And then they started to burn with a powerful light. And as Diana's color fades, Witchfire picks her up and says, okay, you're going to have to brace yourself for this. Your friends just tried to sever the connection between you and Hecate. But they didn't measure it right. Black Orchid and Manitou, they broke free. And then all the power raced into your body. We were talking about a universal level of magical power more than any living host has ever carried, more than any host is capable of carrying. Diana asks, what is she saying? And Witchfire says, you may have just died. But as Diana comes to the startling revelation that she may not survive this, Swamp Thing makes his way to the burning of the Parliament of Trees to stop Black Orchid. As the vines tighten around her throat, Black Orchid screams to please stop hurting her. It wasn't her. Hecate was using her. Swamp Thing yells, the green has been mortally wounded and the Parliament of Trees is gone. Black Orchid tells him she didn't want any of this. She didn't mean any of this. And the vines grip harder and Swamp Thing tells her, it doesn't matter. The green will die because of you. Just then a voice calls out to Swamp Thing, telling him no. The green will not fade, it will change and adapt to something new and worthy of this world. A beautiful new garden paradise will spring forth from these woods and remind the world of nature's might. This is the will of their mistress, Hecate. But for the parliament of flowers to grow, the old must be pruned away. Back at the Oblivion Bar, Manitou begins to wake up asking if they can hear her now. Bobo tells her, It depends. Are you going to try and kill us again? If not, then yeah, we can hear you. How is it you managed to escape Hecate's grasp? Manitou tells him that it is not she who broke free, but something broke her free. The actions of her friends at Nanda Parbat changed the game for a moment. However, it didn't happen soon enough. Magic is already changing hands and it belongs to her now. Kirk runs over to the doorway and as he opens it, he sees a brick wall stating, Oh dear. Manitou goes on stating that if Black Orchid was released as well, then both their powers, two-fifths of it, will flow into the next active host. That body will bear the power until it burns out and the power will at last return to Hecate. Back at Nanda Parbat, Zatanna and Constantine watches as Hecate's power surges through Diana and Zatanna then asks, that didn't go our way, did it? 
Constantine tells her that he's going to take a guess that Diana is more powerful than any god that has ever walked the earth. She could blink us out of existence if she wanted. She calls back to Hecate, asking, What shall I do against those who stood against us? And Hecate tells her to leave them be. They will learn the new meaning of death shortly. Just then, Zatanna and Constantine feel a rumble in the ground as a giant temple shoots out of the ground, destroying the surrounding buildings. A large winged specter appears before the two of them telling them that they stand at the gates of the great necropolis, and they will be brought to the graves shortly. But in the collective unconsciousness, Witchfire looks up at the pale earth, stating that it's almost beautiful in a horrible kind of way. They have front row seats to watch the death of a magic as they know it. Diana looks at the lake where Black Orchid and Manitow were and says that if those two were severed from the witch mark, there must be something down there. You said before that this place was a metaphor, the subconscious of the magic of Hecate herself. Perhaps we could go deeper? Diana then runs, diving into the lakes, and she begins to swim it down. And she swims for hours, even days, until she hits something. She touches the glass, beating on it, hoping for an answer. And then nothingness. And then from the nothingness, a figure appears pulling her through. She climbs out, telling the woman, Thank you, but... What is this place? Who are you? And the woman tells her, You already know the answer to that. My name is Hecate, and you must listen carefully if you're going to survive. But back in the real world, the other heroes try to fight back Hecate's forces when suddenly, all three groups notice a doorway appear before them. They run through the portal, and as everyone arrives on the island of Circe, she tells them that they sure did make a mess of things, didn't they? Satana tells her how could she have, but Circe stops her, telling her, Look, we don't have much time. We don't trust each other, and you think it was foolish to have Diana use Hecate's power. The point is, we were already losing. Hecate replaced two core pillars of magic with her own power. Life and death now belong to her. Nature belongs to her. And if she knocks out a third pillar, the system will fall apart completely. Knowing her, Hecate is after the sphere of gods, a dimensional home of all spiritual and godly energy in the multiverse. If she takes hold there, the magic that holds each of us together will die. And that includes all of you. Best case scenario, will be rewritten with her hate-twisted magic. Bobo Shell is asking, What do you want from us? Give us something and we can make a stand. There are thousands of gates to the spheres of gods. Cersei says, Come on, I thought you were supposed to be a detective. Think of the mythology at play here. Where do you think we should go? Elsewhere, Diana walks ever closer to her target. And when she can't walk, she climbs, and she climbs to the highest point at the highest summit. As she rests her feet, she begins to open up the gateway to the abandoned city of Olympus. Back in the collective unconsciousness, though, the Maiden of Hecate says that she must be brief, as there is a lot to understand. In the beginning, there was magic. It was raw, rich, burgeoning light of possibility surrounded by the still-forming multiverse. Eons later, someone called the Domain the Sphere of Gods, but the story begins long before the gods. Through the dreams of the first beings, there was light. And from that incredible light, the first being shaped herself out of the cosmos. The young girl sensed that she wasn't alone in the dark, and beneath the sphere of gods, there was a darker other place. As she formed from that light, he formed from the darkness, the upside down, staring up at her. To put the horrible creatures out of her mind, she began to visit Earth to watch humanity grow. And she would give them touches of her magic to delight and astound them with the possibilities of the world around them. As humanity grew, the girl was given a name, which meant far off in primitive tongue, as they believed she lived in the moon above, and they called her Hecate. Humanity began to grow and with it, beliefs followed. Pantheons were made, each having their own mysteries and power, and each pantheon tried to win over her favor, each believing that they were a subsidiary to her stories. Hecate allowed this because it amused her so. As time passed, Hecate could feel herself changing, and she felt a responsibility to the new forms of magic and belief. Thus, the aspect of the maiden gave way to the aspect of the mother. There were many offers from the pantheons to try and woo her, and ultimately she agreed to take the hand of the Greek god Hades. The gods of Olympus welcomed her as one of their own. Even the mighty Zeus recognized that her power surpassed even his own. She would be Hecate, the goddess of magic. But in her generosity, mankind noticed the immense power that she wielded and sorted it out for their own. They would mimic the incantations that they had witnessed from her followers capturing her. And every day she would pray to her fiance and her adopted pantheon to come and save her. One day, Hades came to her with a simple message. He had found a new bride. The gods of Olympus had made a decision as she was no longer welcome at their gates. She screamed, and the screams felt what she had not felt in an eternity. The dark, upside-down mirror of her own great power, rolling, toxic, and dangerous. 
full of hate. She called four magicians, giving them what they wanted, a dark magic that would rip the world apart. And she gifted them with nothing but malice and hatred from her heart. The aspect of the mother was shed and replacing it was the new form, the crone, the righteous hate incarnate. Once free, she let the gods know of her fury too, reminding them of her rightful place in the cosmos. And if they dared cross her again, she would turn it against them and end them. But still only trusting herself, she broke her power into five points and hid them within five young girls in whom she saw a sliver of the maiden that she once was. The maiden and the mother tried to retake control, but ultimately the crone dominated and the triple goddess was born. Diana listed, stating that she thinks she understands, but the aspects of the maiden and the mother tell her understand is not enough. Surviving what's to come will take sacrifice. Back on Cersei's island, she tells everyone to look. No point in dancing around this thing. There's only one path to take and they're going to have to kill Wonder Woman. Zatanna shouts that she can't be serious and Cersei says that it's Wonder Woman or magic. If you pick Wonder Woman, we are all going to die, even Diana. She sighs, telling herself, I can't believe that I'm the one making the plea for the greater good here. And she begins to cast her magic, telling everyone that they know what they have to do. The right killing blow to Diana will set off a reaction equal to an atomic bomb in magic. This will be the end of Hecate, and there is no other option. So ask yourselves, what would Wonder Woman do? With that, everyone vanishes. Meanwhile, up in Olympus, Diana continues destroying the place of the old gods and she hears a voice calling out to Hecate, telling her that this is wrong. She looks over and Zatanna goes on stating that she should have trusted Diana more. She should have helped her. And right now, that's what they're going to do for Diana. For Wonder Woman, take the witch down. From inside of the collective unconsciousness, Diana watches as her friends begin to make their final stand. And she begs the aspects to tell her what to do. The maiden and the mother tell her that she must hold on to what is best in her. Hold on to her heart and do not succumb to darkness. Do not become the crone. Hecate's first act of magic divided it in a train. All of the troubles spawn from that division. All paths forward must must take that into account. Diana tells everyone to stand back and Zatanna shouts to Cersei telling her that they need her in order to restore order. She said it was. Diana stops her stating that she wasn't wrong. This feels impossible, but there's something that must be done. Please everyone stand down from the final fight. And as she falls to her knees, she calls out to Hecate, begging for her to listen. Hecate yells for her to continue the destruction of Olympus. Her goddess commands it. Diana tells her she knows the story. The other two thirds told her she knows the pain that she feels and the hatred inside. There are things that need to be changed, yes, but this is not the way to do it. Release your control and use your incredible power to heal magic. Do not tear it down. Hecate shouts that she will not yield and Diana continues to plea, asking her, do not make me kill you. Hecate scoffs, stating, that possibility ended years ago. This is what I am now, and this is all that I will be. Diana looks back at Zatanna, telling her, I'm going to need your help. You're going to have to use your magic. Zatanna pauses for a moment and then tells her that her magic would open up a door to the other kind. It's too dangerous. They'd be trading one unstoppable force for another. And Diana says that she knows the cost of magic. She also knows what must be done. Zatanna stares at her and quietly says, Nepo F. Rude. There's an ear splitting crack a kaboom as lightning strikes and Hecate calls out asking, what have you unleashed? The jagged voice of the upside down man says, ah, yes, I remember this power from so long ago. I can taste it already. Within seconds, the upside down man latches onto Hecate and he begins to devour her, slowly ripping her to pieces bit by bit. Using the last of Hecate's power, Diana opens up a portal back to Earth, focusing her power and draining the last of the witch mark. As that portal closed, the witch mark fades and the death rattle of Hecate echoes throughout all of magic itself, letting everyone know the witching hour is finally over. A few days later in the Hall of Justice, Diana sits alone, and Zatanna says that it seems the Necropolis and the Parliament of Flowers are sticking around. But they are starting to realize that their master is gone, and they will have to play by the old rules if they don't want it all out war. Swamp Thing isn't taking it well, which is to say that he disappeared into the Martian Rose Garden a few hours ago. Bobo and Kirk are handling the debriefing with the rest of the League, and Superman's just upset that he couldn't save all of those people. As Zatanna sits, Diana tells her that she knows how he feels, and she is so, so sorry about all of this. If she had respected the raw power of magic, maybe things would have been different. The other kind are closer to the reality than they have ever thought possible. Olympus is being devoured by them as we speak, and her gods have long since left their heaven empty. Satana smiles, stating, hey, their little ragtag group just saved magic from the virtually omnipotent god. That's gotta count for something, right? And Diana says that she can feel that something still bothers her, though, and Zatanna says yes. But under her skin, really, 
when Hecate's power was broken, it was split into five pieces, with her, Witchfire, Menetau, and Black Orchid, that's four. Somewhat is unaccounted for, and that power flowed from host to host. That would mean that the final host has all of Hecate's power, whether they know it or not. The other kind might not be the only threat in the horizon. Meanwhile, over on an island, in the middle of nowhere, a cackling laughter echoes throughout the stone halls. The plan worked far better than she had ever imagined. How easy it was to guide them to her own ascension. She often dreamed of this moment over a millennia ago, but now that moment has finally arrived. The old goddess of magic is dead and the new goddess is born. Reality trembled with the might of Circe's laughter. The fools actually believed the witching hour had drawn to a close, but the true horror has yet to be seen. A chimpanzee walks into a bar. This may sound like a joke, but it's something far sadder and stranger than that. The bar belongs to perhaps the noblest man the chimp has ever known, Jim Rook. He was the Knight Master, carrying the Sword of the Knight. Rook was the protector of the magical realm known as Mira, and as a mystic superhero, he also defended the mortal world. He did it with a smile and without a complaint. The chimp watches and admires how no matter what, Jim's duties never seemed to bring him down, not once. Jim died, giving the heroes of Earth a chance to escape a cosmic nightmare looming over them. And today, today is Jim's funeral. So, the chimpanzee drinks. The Oblivion Bar is filled with those of the magical world. Some approach the chimpanzee and they wish him well, but the chimpanzee doesn't respond. The bar fills with stories of old, everyone telling how their lives intermingled with Jim Rook. The chimpanzee, he drinks. He was a detective, his mind always driving towards the solution. In the absence of a mystery, it turned inwards, and it turned dark. And he dulls it the best way that he can. A seat saved for the chimpanzee is in front of the others. They should be together. But the chimpanzee stares down and away until he leaves. And then he drinks. He's barely aware of the service going on behind him. Those sitting, grieving. And the chimpanzee, he drinks. The phantom stranger approaches the chimpanzee. He informs him that he is now the owner of the bar, that it is bound to him, and the chimpanzee drinks. The stranger tells him that Jim Rook left something for him, the Sword of the Night, the protectorship of Mira. The chimpanzee looks at the sword placed on the bar, knowing a pact was made. He knows that it is his responsibility. He knows that it means that his friend believed in the best of him, and it's time to live up to that. But first, the chimpanzee drinks. Now, in our current time, Bobo burps, with Zatanna covering her nose, stating that that is the foulest thing that she has ever smelled. Isn't he supposed to be working? But Bobo, aka Detective Chimp, yells that he is working. Can she tell how many people died in this place in the last week? Because he sure as hell can't. And the drinking is what facilitates the working. Tracy storms in saying that what he means is that it facilitates making the witch bartender that he pays next to nothing do all of the work of cleaning the remains of their dead friends. Diana stops her asking if she's okay. And Tracy tells her no, she's really not. Diana hugs her and tells her that she mourns with her. And Tracy smacks Bobo asking if he saw it. That's what sensitive people do, Detective Chimp. Bobo eventually spins back in his chair, asking what brings them to his fine drinking establishment. Are you moving in or something? Diana tells him that the other kind is already devouring Olympus as they speak. The barrier between them and their world is thinner. They could break through at any moment. Swamp Thing has been feeling rumbles in the Tree of Wonder. So he and Constantine have gone off to try and hold off whatever it is. But Constantine believed that there was something in Mira that may help them, a power of some kind. They need help getting there. Bobo stares at Diana for a moment and then says, No. Satana takes the night sword off the bar, telling him that it doesn't matter what he says, they are still going. Satana opens up the portal to Mira, and Diana tells him that he is welcome to come with them or not but they have to move quickly. Bobo shouts, this is a bad idea, very bad idea. And as Diana, Zatanna, and Kirk Langstrom, AKA Manbat, all walk through the portal, Bobo asks if anyone is even listening to him. Tracy tells him, of course not. He got to play hero for a hot second, but they're all about to get to know him a bit better, aren't they? They're gonna go to the world that he messed up. Bobo sighs, stating that her dad was a lot nicer. And that's all he's going to say about that. Hold the fort, kid. I've got some shit to face. 
while Bobo finally works up the courage to cross over. Over in Salem, Massachusetts, Swamp Thing and Constantine are staring at the Tree of Wonder. They felt him coming, so they sent their allies to a distant world on a mission unlikely to bear any fruit. With who's coming, they very well may not see their friends again, but if so, what of it? The Parliament of the Tree is gone. No matter how hard Swamp Thing tries, he feels nothing, and if he dies, he is no longer certain that the Green could even regenerate a new protector in his place. Then there's Constantine. His heaviness in his lungs grow each passing day. There is a constant pain. All of the protections of the demon's blood allowed are gone. He takes out a cigarette from the pack and he says, All right, might as well show yourself, Naboo. Blinding light swirls around them and Naboo asks, Might I? I said it before, that it would be foolish to come here. Constantine lights his cigarette, telling him, Yeah, well, I've never been the listening type. Constantine tells Swamp Thing to show off the new thing that they've been practicing, and with that, the ground violently shakes as Swamp Thing grows in size with Naboo telling him, This is unwise, magician. Constantine tells him, Yeah, don't really care anymore. Kill him, Swampy. Swamp Thing punches down where Naboo is floating and tells him, With pleasure. As Swamp Thing narrowly misses the mark, Constantine hits Naboo with a hellfire blast, and Naboo asks, Do you truly think that this kind of power would even make me flinch, magician? Is that what you wish for? To burn an arcane fire? I can fulfill that desire with ease. As Naboo flies up, a voice calls out telling him that that is enough, and the phantom stranger appears behind Naboo, his former friend, the being that controls Dr. Fate, telling him that he believes that it was their plan to catch the attention of the higher powers of magic on this plane. Meanwhile, over in Mira, Diana charges in headfirst into the fiery breath of a dragon while the others fight off a horde of undead skeletons. Satana cuts down one of the skeletons, stating that this world, why is everything so undead? And Kirk Langstrom flies up, attacking, stating, it's incredible, how does a skeleton carry itself in armor with no muscle or tendons? Bobo tears through a monster, stating that the answer to all of those questions is horrible magic. It's always going to be the answer here. The problem is, I'm the one who casts the spell. Zatanna stops everything. Wait, this is your fault, Detective Chimp? And Bobo asks, are you really surprised by that? Suddenly an arrow falls out of the skies into the undead at the same time that Diana fells the giant dragon. She hops down telling Bobo that there is the cavalry coming, and Bobo says, yeah, I figured as much. Just over the hills, the sounds of stampeding horses make their way to the group with Diana telling everyone to get behind her. Bobo walks out in front, telling her, It's okay. They aren't here for all of you. One of the horsemen rides up to our chimpanzee, telling him that it would seem their nightmaster has returned. Bobo looks up and says, Hey, Dan, been a minute. Blue Devil steps off his horse, and he says that he should have stayed far away from Mira after what he did. We had a pack. It's time that you paid for breaking it. And after a short while back at the castle, Blue Devil explains that it's been like this for months. Nightfall comes and the undead rise out of the earth. All the denizens of Mira have moved into the walls of the capital. Men are led into the fields at daybreak and they spend hours breaking bones into shards in hopes that they deplete their numbers, but there is always more. Satana then says that she still doesn't understand how is Bobo responsible for this. Blue Devil gives a light laugh. <laughs> it's funny that you say responsible. The way I look at it, it's just the opposite. Bobo has never been responsible a day in his life. Out of another part of the capital, crowds begin to gather around the guards as they walk Bobo in chains through the city. They stop just before the prison and Bobo looks up at a statue of Jim stating that he's really sorry for breaking this nice magic world. Pretty dumb of him, huh? God, he could really go for a drink right about now. But back with the others, Blue Devil goes on stating that after Jim's passing, Bobo became unstable. He began to drink more and more and they managed for a while, but then he brought in a spell book. Kurt asks how is it that a magic book broke a magic world, and Zatanna tells him that Mira isn't real in the same way that Earth is. It's a construct, a magical idea that blossomed over time into a full world with its own unique rules. Magic runs through every fiber of this world, and if they stay here long enough, it will change their bodies to fit the rules of this world. Magic on Earth is trying to force an impossible element into the literal world through the power of will. But forging an impossible element into an impossible world requires a different brand of magic. She looks over the tome and after a few moments she says, Oh God, is that the spell he tried to use? And Blue Devil tells her, Yes. 
She groans, rubbing her head, stating, That stupid monkey. Diana asks what's wrong. And Zatanna turns back, shouting that he tried to bring Jim Rook back from the dead. The problem is, death doesn't function the same in this world. So Bobo basically broke death itself. She then turns back to the Blue Devil, stating that she might be able to fix this, but she's going to need all of the warlocks here and now. They need to bring whatever arcane texts and grimoires and whatever the hell they call them here. She might be able to make a sigil that binds the rules of death. Blue Devil tells her that he's not sure that they could help. They already came up with a solution, but it's not something he wants to do, but if he must. Satana asks, what are they planning? And the Blue Devil tells her that they're planning to kill Bobo. Bobo sits in his cell, and Diana comes to him, stating that he should have told them. Bobo looks away, stating, We've all got our demons. Usually people hold up in a bar every night, don't fall asleep sober if they have something to hide. Diana tells him that they're going to fix this, and Bobo asks, Why? Like, really, why? If I die, the responsibility of the Sword of Night will pass on to Dan, and he'll do a much better job. Everyone does much better when I'm not around, so let them live and let me die. Diana kneels down, telling him that she understands, really. She could barely look Swamp Thing in the eyes, knowing what the witch mark did to the Parliament of Trees. She knows what it feels like to be overwhelmed, but it's just that, a feeling. Feelings do not dictate their actions. He wants these people to live here. She holds out a flask, and Bobo takes it. Bless you. She rips the cell door off, telling him, all right, now let's go solve your problem. Meanwhile, back in Salem, Massachusetts, the fight is raging on between Nabu, aka Dr. Fate, and the Phantom Stranger. It seemed that the Phantom Stranger was winning until Nabu started to remove his helmet. The Phantom Stranger turns back, shouting to Constantine and Swamp Thing, run! And just as he finishes, he is sucked into the realm of the helmet. As things go from bad to worse on Earth, the same can be said for Mira. The undead begin their attack on the castle with Zatanna rushing to try and find an answer. She looks through the tome, stating that it isn't even a language. How is she supposed to? But at that moment, Diana runs with Bobo, and he tells her, Let me have a quick look. Blue Devil stands up shouting, You have done enough! And Bobo tells him, The whole problem is that I haven't done enough! Blue Devil asks, And what if it gets worse? So Bobo tells him, then you can take that big ol' axe and lop off my head. I was already for it, but the princess over here doesn't seem to think it'll fix it. Bobo picks up the tome and he turns around stating, there's the problem. I had it upside down. I need to read more and get more mead. Blue Devil yells, you must be joking. And Bobo tells him, actually, I'm not. I'm very, very intelligent, but it's hard to keep focus on a word if the word that I read reminds me of everywhere else that I've seen it. I have a headache. As a soldier runs into the throne room shouting that they are here, the creatures have gotten through the gates. Diana says that she and Blue Devil will hold them off. They need to give him time to work. Blue Devil looks at Bobo. Fine. And he leaves. The chimpanzee studies the tome as the sounds of battle echo throughout the halls. He can hear the screams. And he wants to ignore it. He desperately wants to run, but he knows that he can't. And the chimpanzee drinks. And then he sees what he missed before. There's a section that he did not read. He must have passed out before finishing closing the door. It's all right here. They just need to draw something like this picture. Once the ritual circle is complete, Bobo takes out the sword of night and begins to quietly change. He calls out to the gates of death to hear his command, for he is the night master. And his command is to close the doors. Power erupts from the sword as a blue light fills the room. And at that very second, the spell fades, and the hordes fall. The Blue Devil stops looking around, asking if the idiot monkey actually did it. And back in the throne room, Bobo falls over. There, can we go home now? As the sun rises the next morning, Bobo and Blue Devil meet out in the hills to talk. Blue Devil tells Bobo that he will stay and rebuild the realm, but there's something else. Jim's son is out there, the true heir to the Sword of Night he must be found. Bobo gets ready to open the portal to return home, but as everyone gets ready, Blue Devil pulls Diana aside and tells her to be careful. She believes in him, and when it counts, he's going to let them down, and it's going to cost them everything. Satana and Kirk pass through the portal, and Bobo calls out, asking Diana if she's coming. She quickly hurries along into the portal, but as Zatanna steps through, she feels a sharp pain in her armor. She takes off her jacket to see blood dripping from her arm, and she says that it's Constantine's handwriting. Something is very, very wrong. Diana asks, what is it? And Satana tells her that it states, find Mordru. Just then, Roots burst out of the floorboard and Swamp Thing begins to take shape. Bobo yells, come on, we just cleaned up this place. And Swamp Thing tells everyone, John Constantine has fallen at the hands of Dr. Fate. 
The other kind is here. The war for magic survival begins now. Now in the lighthouse off the coast of Maine, Wonder Woman begins to fend off a group of demons, stating that this is not pleasant work, sister. Zatanna scans through her magical tome, telling her, Yeah, but you make it look so easy. That damned wizard sure didn't make this. Wait, this should do the trick. Abenegzor, wrath and gas, demons of eons past, here before me stand you now, all the powers me endow. Just as Zatanna opens up her mouth, the spirits of three demons are sucked in and she closes the grimoire, stating, It worked. The demons three are down. Wonder Woman asks if she's alright. She just took their power into herself. Doesn't that worry her just a little bit? Zatanna begins to walk away, telling her that she is terrified about so many things right now. This is very firmly on the bottom of that list. Besides, you could use a little bit of hellfire right now. Let's go. As the two climb the stairs, Zatanna says that she sees him. Felix Faust, but he's a little indisposed at the moment. Over in the corner of the destroyed room, Felix sits alone in a state of confusion, drooling from the mouth. Wonder Woman sheaths her sword, stating that one of the other kind must have gotten here first. And Zatanna looks at the scribbles on the parchment papers, telling her, Yeah, it's that damn sanity-eating furball we encountered in Arkham. We do not have time for this. Lup Roy Ndiyam Jutziat. As Zatanna casts her spell, Felix begins to stand up and scream in pain as his mind is stitching itself back together. Zatanna tells him that magic is dying. The other kind are eating it alive. Her father sent her Sargon's Ruby of Life from the other place. He's been tortured by these things for years. They need to find someone who can use it properly and they need to find him. They're going to find Mordru. As agony spreads throughout Felix's body, he mutters, m m Midnight. And meanwhile, over in the Oblivion Bar, Bobo the Detective Chimp yells at the packed pub, telling everyone to just calm the hell down! You'll be served when you're served! Tracy says that it wasn't her idea to fill up this place with refugees from the entire magical community. Bobo sighs, asking, Did you think it was mine? Man Bat is sitting in the Hall of Justice, going nuttier by the minute. Wonder Woman and Zatanna are off solving some great magical mystery, forgetting who the actual detective is. It's just, this place hasn't been like this since the Dark Multiverse invasion. Since Jim. Tracy pats Bobo, telling him that he's doing a good thing. Jim would be proud. They will be here until the gates to the Plains of Limbo open up and just then. Jason Blood walks through the crowd, stating that he's afraid Limbo is no longer an option. The talks between heaven and hell have fallen through. The death of the first of the fallen has angel and demon alike terrified. Bobo hands Jason blood a glass, telling him that whenever he comes in, it's never good news. Jason takes the drink, telling him that he hears Neuron is making a play for absolute control in hell. And if he succeeds, he may be able to make a deal with him. But that will take time that they do not have. As it stands, both parties have closed their gates to earth. But soon, the small Swamp Thing saplings, helping Sir, form together, and Swamp Thing grabs Jason, telling him, That is unacceptable! Jason's eyes begin to burn as he says, Gone, gone, the form of man, rise the demon Etrigan! As Swamp Thing and Etrigan get ready to fight, Bobo shouts, asking, Can we keep the fireworks to a minimum? Some of us are trying to run a business here. Meanwhile, over in Hell's Kitchen in New York City, Zatanna leads Wonder Woman down a dark alley, and Wonder Woman asks if this is the place. Zatanna tells her yes, a club for members of the supernatural community. Spent a week here performing when her father was... Oh. As Wonder Woman pushes open the doors, the stench of death fills her lungs as Zatanna quietly says, God! A wounded man comes out of the shadows, stating, No, it was no god that did this. Zatanna yells, Papa Midnight! And Midnight says that it was them who let these horrifying creatures into their universe. Wonder Woman looks away, stating that she is sorry for his loss, but there is no other way to stop the witch goddess Hecate. Midnight scoffs, telling her, it must be exhausting for the cape and tights, for the amount of time you spend apologizing. But to answer the question of what happened here, well, we were attacked by the other kind. What else can I do for you? Zatanna says that they are looking for Mordru, but Midnight tells her that he will say the same thing that he told her father when he went looking for Mordru. Turn back. Zatanna asks, her father was looking for him? And Midnight says, yeah, he found him here in this very bar. Whenever Mordru would show up, it would always end up messy, since you can't really tell a being that powerful what to do or not to do. Last I heard, Mordru is going to spend some time with the Cold Flame. Hopefully that gives them what they're looking for. But before you go, is it true that John Constantine has been taken out of the equation? Satana tells him, yes, it's true. 
Back at the bar sits the Swamp Thing with Etrigan and a few drinks, stating that they need to figure out something, somewhere they can go and hide out. Mirror would be out of the question because it might not be possible for that place to support the power that is in the bar right now. But just then, Tracy drops her tray, stating that Bobo should come quick. And through the door, the upside down man hangs. How cozy. Do you mind if we join you? We've had a busy day eating all your friends and family, we other kind. Bobo yells for everyone to get out the back. He'll open up a portal. And as the other kind begin to flood into the bar, Bobo swings the Sword of Night, opening up the path to Mira. And once everyone is through, he says that he thinks they're safe. A voice then tells him, no, Bobo. Everyone quickly looks back to seeing Nabu along with the others, telling him, I'm afraid that it has only begun. Bobo quickly shields his eyes from the light, asking, Who the hell are these guys? And Jason says, Though they have never transcended physical form before recorded history, I'd recognize them anywhere. They're the Lords of Order. You'll recognize the Helm of Nabu, but that was merely one of their artifacts. The Gauntlets of Mirath, the Cloak of Sira, the Breastplate of Hoku, and the Boots of Palfil. Each of them has taken a host of great power, as Nabu has taken Kent Nelson. Bobo asks, That's bad, right? And Jason Blood tells him, Yes, it is very bad. Bobo steps forward, holding up his sword. Hey, Fate, you're out of bounds here. I got the Sword of Night. That makes me the Night Master of Mira, and you are not welcome, and neither are your weird looking friends. Nabu looks down, stating, Magic breeds chaos. The chimpanzee is the perfect example of this. The other kind are a purifying fire, an unwitting weapon whose actions play out our grand design. Jason then walks forward, telling him, You are under the impression that you have the greatest powers of magic, that there is no one left capable of facing you. Well, you have not met Etrigan. God gone the form of man, rise the demon Etrigan. As Jason transforms, Nabu easily shields himself, stating, we are the one who taught Merlin. We wrote the first books of magic. And when it is time to choose our hosts, we only pick the finest. Madame Xanadu, Ibis the Invincible, Gregorio de la Vega, once known as Extrano, and Mark Merlin, Prince of Ramon. Nabu then tells Sister Symmetry and Brother Pattern to handle this. The two rush out and each grab one of Etrigan's arms and they begin to pull. Etrigan screams out in pain as Jason is separated from Etrigan and the two fall to the ground. Etrigan looks at Jason telling him, With Neron's call, to hell I'm Beckett. I can't remain another second. Jason scrambles to try and grab a hold of him, but before he can, Etrigan is pulled down to hell. Nabu asks Jason, Do you feel your age? It should be catching up quite quickly now. But before they can go, the Blue Devil storms in with his army asking, What on earth is going on here? He sees Bobo and Nabu, and he looks up telling Nabu, It's good to see you. I was hoping to actually talk with you about rebinding the Sword of Night, and... Blue Devil trails off as he sees Jason rapidly aging, and he asks, Does he look older? Oh man, I missed something important, didn't I? And Bobo tells him, Yeah, you did! Blue Devil then asks, Dr. Fate's one of the bad guys now, huh? And Bobo tells him, Yep. It's a blue devil size. Oh, we're all going to die, and somehow this is Bobo's fault. Bobo tells him, You got that right. <laughs> Sorry about that, Dan. But before they can continue their banter, Blue Devil tells Bobo to use the sword and get them back to the castle. As a pillar of blue light strikes down and everyone disappears, Nabu says, The distractions have removed themselves. Shall we begin? Meanwhile, over at the island of Aia, Wonder Woman kneels down, stating, I know you were here. You have to be. Please, sister, answer my call. And Cersei leans back while sitting on a rock, asking, No unicorns this time. Well, come. The end of the world is happening. Let us have a drink. As the two enter, Zatanna says that they do not have time for drinks. And Cersei says that she could freeze temporal reality for a bit. Great way to catch up on some reading, too. But really, Diana admitted you missed the power of a god coursing through your veins, right? It must sting terribly to have lost the one weapon that seemed to have worked. Wonder Woman ignores the comment, stating that they have searched everywhere. Every hidden world, every hidden place, but they were unable to find him. Cersei swirls her hand in her cauldron, stating, Oh, I know! The Lord of Chaos himself. Do you want more Drew? Zatanna pulls out the Ruby of Life, stating that Papa Midnight pointed them towards the Cult of the Cold Flame. But the other kind got to him first. It is said that her father met with her and more Drew years ago, and they learned the true nature of the other kind. But there is a greater story here. The fact that every step that they take feels ordained. 
Magic is being violently murdered, and they want to know who. But before Cersei can answer, there's a rumbling in the cave, and Wonder Woman asks, what was that? And Cersei laughs. The beginning of the end! There's not much time, it's all going according to my father's plan. Back on Mira, everyone steps out of the portal with a giant Ankh symbol appearing in the sky. Swamp Thing tells everyone to get back, and the two figures start to walk out of it, stating, Ah, oh, wonderful, we found them. Man Bat steps out, and with him a young man, and Blue Devil asks, Who is he? My name is Khaled Nasur. I was Dr. Fate once. A people of Kent Nelson and Naboo before Naboo went down this dark road. Bobo begins to stare at Khaled, and he asks, Weren't you, like, stuck in a vase? Aren't we already in enough trouble? Swamp Thing looks at Bobo and tells him, it might not be wise to speak. And Blue Devil says the same thing. You know, that's a damn fine idea, Swamp Thing. Blue Devil then begins to call out his armies as they begin preparations to defend the castle. But Khaled says that he's sorry. But if they act fast, they might be able to save the sphere of the gods as a whole. But Mira? Mira is already dead. As everyone sits down, Bobo says that he still thinks it's a bad idea letting Manbat learn magic, but no, nobody listens to him. Swamp Thing asks Khaled, You spoke to the Lords of Order. They were destroying Mira? Khaled tells him yes. And every world like it. First will be the Outer Realm, such as Gem World and Ra Realm. But eventually they will march on Heaven and Hell. Bobo says, There has to be a way for us to fight back if the other kind were to find us. Khaled says that the other kind won't eat the reality away from beneath their feet. But the Lord of Order will. Blue Devil then leads his armies to prepare, but as everyone leaves, Bobo looks at the Sword of Night, stating that he was supposed to protect this realm. Jim left it to him. He can't let it happen. Swamp Thing kneels down, stating that Jim Rook would not want to lose this magical realm and his friend in one blow, but right now he can't win this fight. They can't win this fight. Back with Zatanna, she asks, what did she mean by her father's plan? That he knew of the other kind? That they would come, and even now? That they need more Drew? Cersei sighs, asking Wonder Woman if she could please just for this moment. Wonder Woman hands her her lasso, telling her only this once. And Cersei explains that her father, Giovanni Zatara, saw this path laying out before him and he prepared for it. He sought counsel from the Lord of Chaos, Amordru, to learn the truth of the origins of magic. This set everything into motion. This is the reason that they must seek Mordru. Along on that adventure, he brought along another man that he met, John Constantine. And upon hearing his name, Zatanna says that she has to step away. She goes outside, falling to her knees before raising the earth around her. She tries to catch her breath from releasing all of that magic, but as she does, something begins to form behind her. An other kind creature takes form, telling her, Flasho, Flasho. Wonder Woman and Cersei rush out as Cersei says that she'll handle this, but Zatanna tells her no. She needs to let off some steam. Her magic might not hurt it, but it can hurt the world around it. And as she casts her spell, the ground lifts up, encasing itself around the creature. The creature tries to move, but as it lays trapped, Zatanna says that she needs to find Mordru and the answers that he gave her father, and she needs to find him now. Cersei says that the truth is, Mordru has been waiting for them. Go home, he will find you. Wonder Woman tells Zatanna to wait, but before she could stop her, Zatanna casts another spell, teleporting the two of them away. But as Cersei walks back to her cave, the Upside Down Man appears, stating that she is playing a dangerous game. Cersei tells him that if he is here to frighten her, then he must not have learned anything. He can't touch her as long as she bears the witch mark. Soon they will get what they deserve, the Amazons and the rest of them, and they will learn the meaning of suffering, as will he. The Upside Down Man laughs as he disappears, telling her, I look forward to it. Back at Mira, Blue Devil gives his orders when suddenly Symmetry appears before them, stating that they have an offer. They are all brave enough to fight against the Lords of Order. They honor that, which is why they will allow everyone's safe passage back as long as they strip everyone of their magic. All knowledge, all memories, all of it. Those who agree will have a mortal life, free of the dangers of the other kind and the Lord's business here. Those who don't, you will die. You have five minutes to decide. And as Symmetry disappears, Swamp Thing asks if they can really do that. And Khaled says, yes, they can. Man Bat then asks, what can they do? 
and Kala tells him at this point, they really only have one answer, and that is to run. So later at the Hall of Justice, Wonder Woman and Zatanna walk through as the Flash plays his welcome intro. Wonder Woman says that Cersei couldn't have meant that Mordor would be here, right? What are they even looking for? Zatanna then asks, how long have they served drinks at the Hall of Justice? Wonder Woman asks, what? Never. Superman wouldn't even allow ale served in the private cafeteria. Why? Zatanna motions to the old-fashioned tavern in the middle of the Hall of Justice, stating that that is probably what they're looking for. As the two walk in, Wonder Woman asks if she's telling her that one of the most powerful dark magicians in existence has just been sitting in the Hall of Justice drinking beer. Morger then laughs. <laughs> what of? Please, you do me a disservice. Join me. Zatanna tells him no, but as Mordru waves his hand, both Zatanna and Wonder Woman are forcibly brought to their chairs and bound. And Mordru says, you misunderstand, that was not a request. Now let us each get a drink, and then we will start explaining why I shouldn't kill you where you sit. Over in Core, the blue pillar of light appears, and Bobo tells everyone that they need to make it quick. Khaled says that he has read about the people in Merlin's biography, the Homo Magi. They were taught at the Rock of Eternity. They were the people who built Atlantis. They took magic and they spread it over the world. And while everyone sits down to try and come up with a plan, one of Blue Devil's soldiers, Roderick, asks where will they go? Blue Devil tells him that they will find a place. Isn't that right, Bobo? And Bobo says, yeah, as a member of the Justice League, I can talk to a few countries, put together some land. Hell, we'll even get television. Blue Devil stands back up, placing his hands on Roderick's shoulders, telling him that they will get through this. They will. But before he could continue, Roderick's skin begins to burn away, as many of the people of Mira begin to burn from the inside out. Blue Devil tries to grab a hold of a young girl, shouting, Stop! They are people! You can't just do this! And Symmetry tells him, Yes, we can. Nabu and Symmetry float down with Nabu stating, Mira is gone. Its people were a part of its fabric. Fictional beings. Now they are nothing. As they should be. Pluto grabs his axe, shouting, I will kill you! But Nabu holds his hand out, telling him, No, you will not! As gold light washes over Blue Devil, his body begins to stiffen as he turns to stone. Bobo looks at him, telling him, No, we have to get out of this place, everyone! But as Bobo swings the sword, nothing happens. He asks, What's wrong? And Khaled says that the Sword of Night was tied to Mira, and with Mira destroyed, it is nothing more than a sword now. Nabu says that their five minutes are up, and Symmetry asks, What is your choice? Swamp Thing begins to state, We will never. But Jason stops him, telling him, We choose to live. Everyone stops, and Bobo says, Wait, what? Back at the tavern, Mordru looks at the Ruby of Life, stating that this is a curious object. This may, in fact, be the first magical artifact. We saw the life of Hecate before we set the other kind on her to devour her. We saw the Lords of Order. We saw him. What you may not know is that it was my job to watch over Hecate once she was captured. My job was to convince her to give up all of her power to them so that they could make better use of it. The Lords of Order taught themselves these noble bastions of moral justice. But I was the Dark Hand. The pain I inflicted on her night after night, it was unspeakable. What order could arise from that? Wonder Woman says that he is a disgusting man. And Mordru drinks his ale, stating, Yes, I am disgusting. I am a foul thing, and I always have been. I have killed millions by my own hand. I am a plague upon this world that has been around for thousands of years, and I will still continue to be here after you've all become dust. He looks at Wonder Woman and asks, Do you hate me? I can taste it. You don't even have to say it. Zatanna yells to stop, but Mordru waves his hand, telling her, Silence! And suddenly her mouth and nose are sealed. Mordru looks back at Wonder Woman, asking, Do you know the difference between chaos and order? Wonder Woman doesn't answer, and Mordru slaps her. He goes on, That is chaos. Magic is dangerous. We all know that. We are trying to use our own imaginations to rewrite reality itself. Magic of order, with its spells and pentagrams and books. It asks the universe politely. Chaos is a little different. There's no spells, there's no sigils. It does not ask the universe. Chaos takes what it wants. And when the universe recoils in horror, it directs the energy right back against us. 
Wonder Woman struggles, stating that he claims to know the threats they face, but he will survive them. If he is so desperate to show off to a few young women how powerful he is, why not face them? Why not destroy them? And Mora Drew glares back at her. Because I don't want to. Do not mistake me for an ally. I am Mora Drew, the Lord of Chaos, the only true Lord of Chaos. Mora Drew then picks up the Ruby of Life, stating, And I am not amused by this twisted moral desire to run to death. That's your help. Enough power to get the job done. Enough power to rip the universe in half. And with that, I take my leave of you. And don't come looking for me again. Next time, you won't live. I don't care who you are. As everything suddenly vanishes, Zatanna coughs as she breathes, stating that she shouldn't have started this journey. She should have never tried looking for, but Wonder Woman tells her, Now, this has been hard on all of us. We have taken the orderly path so far, and it's left us close to ruin, with all of the magic on the verge of death. As Wonder Woman picks up the Ruby of Life, there is a bright purple light that transforms her and Zatanna. And she says, Perhaps it's time we broke the damn rules, sister. Back at the Temple of Kor, a magic user is stripped of his powers, and Symmetry says that he is free. Join the world with no memory of what you have lost. Next. Kaladin steps forward, stating, Do it. It'll be nice to be able to forget how disappointed I am right now, believing in all the lies. Naboo tells him that they were not lies. You served the order well. You should stand with us. Khaled looks away, stating, no, just do it and be done with it. Over on the side, Bobo says, I can't believe this. Why would you want this, Jason? And Jason asks, why would I want people to live? This gives them a chance to flee and hide. And Swamp Thing then says, they will evade death a few moments longer than the rest. And Jason nods, stating yes. But just then, there's a rumble, and it begins to rain. And Bobo holds out his hand, noticing that the rain is not rain, but blood. Khaled shouts at Nobu, asking, Aren't you gonna do it? Erase my memory. And Nobu stops, stating, There is something wrong. Just then, a bolt of lightning strikes with a loud, Crackoon! Wonder Woman and Zatanna step out of the smoldering crater with Wonder Woman yelling, Naboo, we would have a word with you. Naboo asks, what have you done? What dark magic have you embraced? Zatanna steps forward stating that she has served the magic of order since she was a child, but deep down it never set right. You want to strip away all of the magic and create order. That is a coward's path. We can win. We can win by embracing the full horror and power of imagination untethered by paltry laws. You want to stop us? Try. As the other members of the Lords of Order appear, they say that she is mistaken. The two of them cannot face the five of them. Wonder Woman laughs, stating that they should count. Meet the new Lords of Order. And as the lightning strikes again, Man Bat, Swamp Thing, and Bobo all radiate with the power of chaos. Soon the fighting begins, and with every swing that the Lords of Order throw at them, the Lords of Chaos are able to push them back. Man Bat says that he can see it, the magic underneath everything. It's beautiful. What was I supposed to do? Satana begins ripping reality, telling them to break it, break it, break it all. Bobo lunges at Symmetry, shouting, you killed him, you killed all of them. My sword can cut through magic. It is because I decided it. This is for Mira. Down below, Khaled tells Naboo that he needs to stop this. He will be bound here away from the battle. He is afraid because he doesn't know how to win, so he will lose on his own terms. That is not right. Naboo holds out his arm, telling him, You will die. But a voice screams out no, and Kent Nelson begins to pull off the helmet. And Naboo tells him, You cannot fight, Mr. Nelson. John Constantine then appears, telling him, Yeah, he's not going to. And the phantom stranger tells him, None of you will. As Naboo struggles to try and keep the three of them locked away, Jason asks Zatanna if she needs help. He can take the hellfire in her. The demons three. Zatanna then says, give them hell. And she releases the demons from her body and into Jason's blood. He stands up young once again and says, gone, gone, the ravages of age with the demons three. Let's show them rage. Together with the demons three, he begins to rip the helmet off of Nabu, freeing those trapped within the Doctor Fate helmet. And the other lords begin to step through a portal, stating that they must regroup. They will leave Nabu to reap what he has sown. Symmetry flies towards them, asking for them to wait, but Bobo leaps down, slamming his sword through her cloak, stating that he just cut her magic off from the source. It is done! 
Naboo flies up with just his helmet, asking, Do you think that I'm not as powerful without a host? That I require anything? Kent calls out that they're going to do a little spell and bind his power within the helmet so that he cannot use it without another's help. Lock him away good this time. Naboo yells, No! And Zatanna charges up, stating, Yes, I can see it. And as the mages focus their power, she grabs a hold of the helmet, and soon a large pillar of light appears. Soon the helmet drops to the ground with a clatter. And Kent tells Zatanna that she must fix what she's done. She needs to believe in a better way to shape the chaos into something more ordered. Mold reality with a focused mind. John tells her that this is everything her father ever wanted for her. And she tells him yes. That is why she cannot be the one. She has doubted too much. She doesn't know if she can be that person. But who among them is capable of wielding this might? Khaled smiles, stating, That much wonder, even... And everyone looks at everyone, stating, Oh. As all of the magic users gather, Wonder Woman calls out, Beings of magic, hear me. Hear me everywhere that this power can reach. I am Diana of Themyscira. I am Wonder Woman. And for far too long, I have ignored the horror that your community's protectors have allowed. The old rules allowed a great darkness to emerge. Those you counted on to keep you safe from harm try to feed you that darkness. I am here to protect you. We are here to protect you. Believe in us. Believe in a brighter path of magic that will lead us out of the dark. We are the Justice League of the Dark, and we will protect you. Chapter 1. A long time ago in the Valley of Ur, a 12-year-old Kent Nelson followed his father across a blistering desert. They had been walking for hours, but Kent's father, Sven, said that it was just a little further. Kent tried to remember all the laughter his father got when he met with their contact in Baghdad, as Sven spoke of the extraterrestrial wizards that he had seen in his dream. He tried to shake the feeling that they were right, that his father didn't spend their life savings when no university or museum would support the expedition. In the end, were they right? Was Kent Nelson's father crazy? After a long trek, the two finally stumbled upon a temple. Kent said that they were out of water and needed to return, but Sven told him no. This is what they've been looking for. Look, all the writing on the walls. It's not Chaldean. It's not Egyptian. It's not even Babylonian. This is a new language, son. But while Sven marveled at the ancient text, Kent could hear something, like something was calling to him in the back of his mind. Before him was a tomb with a man inside. Suddenly, the voice called out to him again, and Kent asked if he wanted him to push the lever. So, Kent pushed it, despite his father telling him no. Just then, a poisonous green gas spewed out, and Sven fell to the ground. Kent asked what was wrong, and the man stepped out of his tomb, telling him that he is dead. The gas released, and it killed him. He killed him. Kent yells no. It was a trick, and the man says that it could not have been helped. He will, however, repay him for his loss with incredible powers. At that moment, everything changed. Kent's mind was flooded with centuries of arcane lore, every secret to magic that the old wizard had gathered in his time. It changed Kent. Time flowed through him, and the magic rewrote every molecule in his body to bring him to his physical and mental peak. In an instant, Kent knew how to fly, how to master the elements, how to be one with the greatest sorcerers who had ever lived. Kent would stand whole and perfect, a being of order. The wizard then told him that his name was Naboo. Take the power that he has granted him and strike him down. And without hesitation, Kent did just that. Using his newfound powers, he tore that wizard apart with an arcane blast. But inside of the false body was an object, a vessel, a helmet. With that vessel, Kent Nelson would become the great hero of order for this world. He would become Dr. Fate. In the current times, Kent reflects back on his past, with Wonder Woman telling him that she hopes he likes the coffee. Bobo doesn't know how to brew a pot without at least half a handle of bourbon in it. Kent laughs and Khalid says, right, don't drink anything that Bobo offers. Seems like a good rule of thumb. Wonder Woman then asks if he's considered the offer. And Kent tells her that he's done nothing but. He has sacrificed much to get to where he is. He left his wife in pursuit of order. He didn't really have a choice. But this? Wonder Woman says that they have just broken magic. They may not want Nobu's brand of order, but they need order nonetheless. Kent tells her that she'll have both. He and Khaled. 
but he will not put on the helmet. He can't. The stakes are too high. Dr. Fate is too dangerous. Wonder Woman tries to speak, but Kent Nelson stops her, telling her that he is no longer the symbol that they once saw. He is no longer fit to bear the onk. Now, let's go see that chimp about a cup of coffee. Afterwards, you can give me a closer look at the wonderful dragon skeleton of yours. Chapter 2 As John Constantine sits at the counter of the Oblivion Bar, Zatanna tells him that they really, really need to talk. Tracy begins to pour another glass for John, but John says to just leave the bottle. He sinned a lot and he's going to need it to relieve himself of the burdens. Just as he finishes, he sets the bottle down, asking Zatanna how Mordru is doing these days, still completely and unbelievably insane. Zatanna looks at him and says that she's going to talk and he's going to say something real, or she doesn't know what she's going to do with him. She remembers how it all felt that night at Winter's Gate. They were watching something truly terrifying and unknown from the primordial darkness swallow the heavens, trying to see something their human eyes were never meant to see. The magic started to burn her from the inside and her father reacted. He took the spell unto himself, igniting into flames. Her father looked at him, stating that if he didn't deliver her safely from that table, he would haunt him for all eternity. It didn't seem like much at the time, but he was talking about something specific, wasn't he, John? I spent my adult life thinking that I had gotten my father killed to go on some magical adventure, but now I'm being told it was all a lie, that my father and you knew something, didn't you, John? All the tension between us. You've just been waiting for this next round, for the darkness to rear its ugly head again. Now talk, damn you. Explain, what was my father's plans, Constantine? John tells her that he can't. His lips are sealed by the best magic around. Her dear old dad saw to that. Hell, she can even get the Amazon's funny rope and it still won't do a lick of good. She wants to know how this all started? Fine. Not all of them were raised by a bloody magical luminary. John lights his cigarette stating, I learned magic on the wrong side of the tracks. Scraps of paper, dusty old grimoires tell me and my mates that if we had the balls, we would boss around the worst kind of dark forces. We were all in a band too, mucus membrane. We played in all those rundown clubs all over England and met our fair share of back alley occultists along the way. We played a spot called the Casanova Club over in Newcastle. The owner was a real piece of work, stiffed us out of our pay. So we figured we'd round up the gang and take care of a few things. Well, the owner, he was in the occult as well. The owner would often have these little parties, one where he forced his little girl Astra to play a part. And the night before, in her pain and hatred, she accidentally called for something wicked, straight out of hell. It butchered everyone in the room, Z, and it went on to possess her. So I thought I could show my friend something out of the exorcist and I would help her. Who would have thought that summoning an even more powerful demon would be a bad idea? The thing that appeared, it dragged that poor girl's soul straight to hell with it. The superhero types all have an origin story, right? Well, that's mine. Do you think I liked being a pawn in all of this? That I wanted to be taken out of that asylum, forced to investigate some looming magical crisis that got my mates killed? All of them died because your father needed me to get that walking houseplant to save magic, without you getting any wiser. Satana asks, why though? And John grabs his glass, telling her, your father was the greatest sorcerer of his generation. And now he's stuck there, powerless. And now you, you were his secret plan to save all of this. I know more than I'm saying right now, but I still can't say a bloody word of it because your father won't let me. Now I'm stuck here, powerless without my demon blood. If I can't set things right, the cancer is going to hollow me out into nothing. This is my payment for helping Giovanni Zatara save the bloody world. John begins rubbing his head, stating that he's sorry. He knows that's not what she wanted to hear, but it's the truth. She should have killed him for all the things that he's done. It'd be a relief, honestly. All the things her father made him do, the things that he didn't. Satana then tells him, no. She's never going to trust him again, but everything that he knows is too valuable to not have on hand. It may be between Kent, Khaled, and herself that can get him talking. And even if they can't, she's still going to need his help to pull this off. So John asks, so what are you planning? And Satana gets up stating that many years ago, he got her father trapped in the other place, tortured for years by the upside down man. He's going to help her get him back and if they survive, she never wants to see him again. Chapter three. Meanwhile, over in the dark and dreary island of Aea, the small drone flies through the rain. The world is changing and Circe can feel it in her ancient soul. A great darkness rising in the hearts of men and with it, perhaps a great opportunity. Doom is coming. The mortals have begun to cheer at its arrival. After all, that's what the man on the television said, wasn't it? It was supposed to be the year of the villain. And they would all be villains together. This moment could be of use to her, perhaps in more ways than she expected. 
As the drone lands, Cersei tells the little machine, Hello, do you have something to tell me? And a hologram of Lex Luthor appears and tells her that he has been watching her actions with the greatest of interest. The way she played Wonder Woman and her followers as her incredible power grew as she prepares for the great witching war. She may have the power to defeat the heroes of magic, but wouldn't her victory be assured if she had an army capable of wielding it? Magic has its own Justice League. Isn't it time they had their own Legion of Doom? Cersei feels the witch mark on her chest beginning to burn as she says, All right, I'm listening. As the glow of the moon illuminates the Hall of Justice, inside the confined walls, Wonder Woman sleeps. But as she does, she tosses and turns, and soon she can see it. She sits up to see the entire room is on fire, and a voice is calling out to her, a voice that says that it is time to finally speak to one another. Wonder Woman asks who is there, and then like magic, the fire parts showing her where to go. She follows the path downstairs and looks around, stating that this looks like the Wintergate Manor. But she takes it that he isn't Baron Winters. The man on fire, laying on the table, lifts his head and says that she must forgive him for the bold opening. He had very little imagery to work with. Wonder Woman examines the man, stating that he is Zatara, the father of Zatanna. And Zatara says, yes, but please sit. We don't have much time, Wonder Woman. My daughter Zatanna has the power to save us, but your power is quite the opposite. I tried to tell Zatanna this back when this all began, Wonder Woman. You are the great shining hero of light, the daughter of Zeus himself, but you have felt the dark tendrils of magic entangling your very soul. You have held magic's power. Wonder Woman tells him yes, and she relinquished it, but he laughs, telling her, oh, if only it was that easy. You see, it's still inside of you, and if our adversary gets it, there will be no hope left. Wonder Woman states the other kind, the upside down man. The Zatara says that he is a force of nature, and he has struck a deal with the one that she needs to fear. Your enemy is on the move. Her army is being built beneath your feet. When she has her last recruit, you will fall. But suddenly Wonder Woman feels a presence, and when she looks back, the upside-down man appears in the window, stating, Oh, Zatara, you're cheating again! Perhaps it's time I eat that mouth of yours! Zatara stands up yelling, You should not have said his name! The great witching war is about to begin. Now, Iquapu! In an instant, Wonder Woman wakes up in her bed, gasping for air, and she grabs her communicator, radioing to Zatanna that she had the strangest. But Zatanna stops her, shouting that they have been trying to reach her for the better part of an hour. They are being attacked by vampire, and there are entirely too many vampires. As the vampires swarm the Justice League Dark members, Bobo yells that he swears that whatever unholy magic gods haven't been killed in the past hour, if he gets turned into a vampire, he is biting everyone. Manbat swoops in, picking up Bobo, telling him that that is incredibly rude. And Bobo laughs, telling him, It's not like you aren't already halfway there. While everyone continues to stand their ground, Khaled yells that he needs everyone to get down. Kent and him are ready with the spell. It's about to get very bright in here. A second later, a blinding light, the light of Dr. Fate, shines in, burning away the vampires, and Zatara says that that should clear up the entire coven. Wonder Woman tells her that she's sorry for not being there. But Zatanna says that it's cool. But, uh, they gotta finish up here. Talk to her soon. So later at the Oblivion Bar, Wonder Woman meets with Constantine and tells him that she feels that there is more to this thing than they see. Someone has been helping her along the way and she has to find out who, and Constantine says that he has been in the dishonest business for most of his life. Here's a tip. Who has been there every step of the way? Who a few months ago would you never have expected to take a second look at this? And Wonder Woman pauses for a moment and realizes what he's talking about. Back at the church, the other Justice League Dark members begin to clean up when Bobo notices a cat hiding in the pews. He reaches out, grabbing it by its tail, but the cat spins around, swiping at his face. So he throws the cat, shouting, Ow! The little monster scratched me! And Zatanna says that he did grab it by its tail. It was within its rights. Anyway, they need to go clean up. Elsewhere in the church, though, the cat wakes up along the high rise, and a young boy says, Aw, did the bad chimpanzee touch you, my little sweet tickle? We will teach him the rules of our little games. You do not touch the toys of the witch boy. However, as the witch boy finishes, Manbat flies up and says, Hello, I know we look frightening, but I swear the horror has ended. It's safe for you to leave now. 
The witch boy tells him that everything is fine. There is no one up here but a menacing shadow and a pounding sense of dread that you'd never admit to your teammates. You want them to like you after all, right? How painful would it be for them to learn about the fraud that you are? As the witch boy casts his spell, Manbat begins to cry, stating that he is a fraud. What if they find out? The witch boy tells him that he needs to make a very frightening serum then. He'd have to scare them so that they'd know to never tell. Manbat looks away and says, that's right. Yes, yes, I can do that. As the man bat flies back down to the others, the witch boy tells his cat that it's time for them to get back to the others. A short while later, over in Jamaica, the witch boy appears and his cat begins to growl. He looks up at the slumbering Solomon Grundy and he tells the cat that it's okay. Dear Cyrus is a friend of ours and ally. Isn't that right? Grundy looks down. Grundy, Mundy. Just then, Papa Midnight walks out, stating that poor old Grundy's brain has rotten away, Clarion. You would have more luck speaking to one of the shambling guests here at the resort. One of the undead then brings them a tray of drinks, and Clarion says, Oh, a Shirley Temple, my favorite! But, uh, do you think that she found another recruit for this witching war that we've signed up for? Out of the brush, Woodrow steps out, stating that he believes that it may be him. And at that moment, a familiar voice calls out, The time for introductions will be soon enough. The time to act has come. Hecate's rule over magic is finished, and soon the magic will meet its new goddess. Cersei, the one that Wonder Woman was referencing, begins to gather her power, yelling that the witching war has begun, and they do not understand what they face. They believe that their Justice League Dark will be enough, but with their last recruit, the Justice League Dark will fall. Midnight asks who is left to recruit, and Cersei tells him that history has given this being many names, but the heroes, they call him Eclipso. Later at the Hall of Justice Archives, Zatanna runs with the others, stating that they came as quickly as they could. What is? But before she could finish, Wonder Woman tells Swamp Thing that she has a question. When they were on that island with Cersei, could he feel the green or did the magic of the island isolate it? Swamp Thing thinks back and tells her that he sensed nothing, nothing wrong as far as he could remember. Wonder Woman says that she needs his eyes on the island. They need to see if Cersei is still there. So after a few moments, he says that the island is empty. It is as if she was never there, but the energy of it is familiar. Wonder Woman tells him that that energy is the witch mark. Cersei is the final bearer of the witch mark. That's why she wouldn't face Hecate directly. She wanted all the others to fall so that all that witch mark power would go right to her. Khaled rubs his neck, stating that he is so lost. And Bobo tells him that it was a whole thing, a real bad thing. Wonder Woman here became the witch. Wonder Woman then says that they need to find out what Cersei is plotting. Swamp Thing, Bobo, Man, Bat, Khaled will focus on that. She, Kent, and Zatanna will have a private conversation. And as the others leave, Zatanna and Kent follow Wonder Woman and Zatanna says that something happened. What is it? She begins to tell him that her father came to him in a dream. She explains that her father said that Wonder Woman was going to destroy the world, that there is still a great deal of power in her, that she is still holding on to the power of the witch mark. As the three get closer to a sealed door, Kent says that he can feel something powerful ahead. And Wonder Woman tells him that she designed this cavern in the Hall of Justice. Its true purpose was to contain the harmful, extremely dangerous objects, some of the most menacing magical artifacts that have ever existed on our plane of reality. The doors creak open, and dozens of artifacts are on display, and Wonder Woman says that they have a few here, such as the Spear of Destiny, the Ace of the Winchesters, and the Crystal Ball of Merlin. Kent looks over at the helmet of Naboo, stating that he was wondering where they put the Doctor Fate helmet. Wonder Woman continues telling him that if she could build a prison to hold him, then it can hold Naboo. Kent says who, and opens up the next door, stating the Black Diamond of Eclipso. Eclipso yells from his crystal, RELEASE ME! And Kent steps back, asking why would she bring them here? She looks at him, stating that she needs to return to Hecate's domain, at the crest of the collective unconsciousness, above the sphere of the gods. She needs a power tied to the symbol of the moon to do that, and she needs them to make sure not to hand her soul over to Eclipso while they do it. Zatanna says that they can't, but Wonder Woman stops her, stating that they must. Please, if there is still power within her, they may have a chance. They must move before it's too late. There's no telling what Cersei already has set in motion. Meanwhile, over at the Parliament of Flowers, the Parliament shouts, demanding to know who disturbs them. Woodrow states that he is their elemental guardian, the protector of the green. One of the flowers states that they did not choose him. 
and Woodra opens up his mouth, stating that they will find him to be an excellent choice. He ate their champion. He took the power from the king of the petals, and he has come here offering up a proposition from the new goddess of magic. They were promised a new world, a world of flowers, and he can give it weight. Someone is here. From the bushes, Swamp Thing lunges out, asking, What are you doing? Woodrow quickly binds him up, telling him that he does not belong here anymore. He shall gift him blight, and it will eat him out from the inside. It will be a struggle to hold one's form, to even stay alive. Swamp Thing sees his arms beginning to wilt, and he yells, Stop! And as he frees himself, Woodrow yells, Yes, run through the vines, you horrible Swamp Thing! Go back to your dank place of death. Back at the Hall of Justice, Swamp Thing screams out in pain, trying to hold his form, and Bobo shouts, asking, What's wrong? Swamp Thing turns back as his body is deteriorating, stating, Abby, find Abby! She can stop the rot. As Swamp Thing's body turns into a pile of green goop, Bobo holds his head, stating, Damn it! This is the beginning of something! Why can't we just have a moment of peace? Just then, Manbat walks up holding a syringe, stating, You all thought I was mad, some terrible fraud. You don't understand the monsters that live inside my head. I've kept them all from you. Bobo asks, What are you? And Khaled states that he is under some kind of a spell. Manbat takes the syringe and begins to push it into his neck, telling them, I need to show you. As he injects himself, his body begins to grow into a giant, grotesque creature with several heads and mouths. And back at the armory, Kent and Zatanna focus their spells, and Kent says that this is a terrible idea. Zatanna, no matter what, they must not touch the stone. Zatanna scoffs, stating that she wouldn't touch the thing even if she wanted to. And Eclipso begins to sniff, stating that he can smell the magic. Give me a taste, it's been so long. Zatanna calls out to Wonder Woman, telling her that she has to hurry, and as Wonder Woman opens up her eyes, she wakes up in the collective unconsciousness, asking if it worked. Witchfire smokes a cigarette, stating that that's one way of putting it. And Wonder Woman tells her that she needs help. She needs to find the center of Hecate's power. Witchfire blows the smoke back, telling her, You should run. You should have run to the other side of eternity. As Witchfire trembles, Wonder Woman asks what has her so frightened, and at that moment, Cersei appears behind them. Witchfire runs off screaming, and Cersei asks where would she run to? The power in this dimension is a part of her now. As Wonder Woman's body begins to split apart, Cersei goes on showing images of her team, stating that she can see that her agents have bound with the powers of life and death. Each now serves Cersei now. Wonder Woman tries to maintain herself, stating that she was played. And Cersei tells her, yes, like a fool. You were always so desperate to see the best in people. You failed to see their true intentions. Hecate has offered you a piece of her soul, and you didn't want just a piece. You wanted it all, and you shall have it all, Diana. Back at the Hall of Justice, Bobo and Khaled hide behind a pillar, watching Manbat from afar, and Khaled says that it looks like they shook him off their trail. Bobo asks, what the hell did that lunatic do to himself? And Kala tells him that Manbat is clearly enchanted. Perhaps this is intended to be a distraction. Bobo nods, telling him that a giant mutant bat from hell is a pretty good distraction. He then pulls the remains of Swamp Thing out of his pocket, scratching his head, asking, And who is Abby? Khaled shouts, Don't ask me. I was stuck in a vase for the past year. Suddenly, Manbat shrieks and comes crashing down, stating, You, you need your medicine. As the two begin to run, Bobo shouts, asking, Where the hell is Wonder Woman? As he stops, he looks at the door, stating, Actually, this might work. Follow me, Khaled. Back in the collective unconsciousness, Cersei tells Wonder Woman that she knows the story. In the beginning, there was magic, and her name was Hecate. She was a blinding light of creativity, of imagination. Her power was near limitless, and she was a more than a goddess. She was creation itself. She was the moon, the true moon, the silver light that cast its magic down upon the earth, and they feared her. Nature was meant to be balanced. The yin was meant to have the yang, but Hecate had sealed away her dark double, the upside down of her power, and without an opposite, Hecate was unstoppable. The other great powers would need to craft a dark mirror of her power, a spirit of unbridled vengeance that hated all magic, a means of fighting back should she ever grow too powerful, the power to eclipse her own. 
Cersei goes on stating that once she holds Eclipso's diamond, there will be nothing that can stop her. With Wonder Woman's distorted face, she looks back, stating that you have gone mad. I feel for you. Let me help. No singular being is capable of wielding that kind of power, Cersei. You saw what happened to Hecate, how it broke her mind. Cersei scoffs, telling her, Hecate was weak, and I do not have such weakness, Diana. Meanwhile, over at the Oblivion Bar, Boba begins drinking out of several bottles as Khaled asks, Really? This is your great plan? Bobo tells him, cool it, almost there, found the right one. Khaled pulls Bobo from the bar, yelling that a giant monster is trying to kill them. And at that moment, Man Bat bursts in through the doors. And Bobo says that all the knowledge in the damned universe has taught him a few things. That the monsters win. The monsters will always win. Good people, good people get in their way and it destroys them. It's foolish to try, self-destructive, irresponsible. And lucky for him, he is all of those things. As Bobo finishes stuffing a piece of cloth into the bottle, he lights the tip on fire and throws it at the monstrous man bat, igniting a ring of fire around him. Bobo grabs another bottle from the bar, taking a drink, telling Khaled that now that they have that settled, they need to find out what can be done to reverse all of this. He's got somewhere to be. Bobo walks over to the statue of the blue devil and says that he needs help. Constantine walks out of the shadows, stating that man bat has lost his marbles. Can't say that that's really surprising, though. Bobo reaches into his coat, telling him that it's not about that. It's about the goopy mess that Swamp Thing has turned into. Constantine takes a slow drag from his cigarette. Oh, hell. Bobo lights a cigar and says, does Abby ring any bells? And Constantine groans. Damn it. This is all going sideways. Back in the archives, Wonder Woman gasps for air, jolting up. Zatanna tries to catch her breath, telling her that they had to pull her back. They were losing control. They put Eclipso back in his cage. Kent asks if she got what she needed and Wonder Woman pulls her cloak over her head stating that she did. She got exactly what she needed and as she smiles, the witch mark burns in her forehead. Back in the collective unconsciousness, the real Wonder Woman, now trapped in this otherworldly domain, yells, No, Zatanna, hear me, sister! The witch mark tells her that it's not going to work. It's all over now. Everything has changed. Wonder Woman gets a glimpse of a green light that appears over her because doom has come and Cersei is in control of her body. Back in the armory, the Cersei-controlled Wonder Woman says that she knows the location of Cersei. They must gather everyone together and act. But before leaving, Cersei looks at the diamond that has Eclipso in it, the last member of her league that she needs to create her forces of darkness. And she picks it up, stating that they will need this to show the others. Let's go back to the central hall and quick. This next part must happen fast. As Cersei looks into the diamond, Eclipso looks back and sees who it actually is. Ho <laughs> this'll be good. Once everyone meets up, Zatanna sees Manbat lying on a table, mutated by the magics, and asks what happened. Bobo tells her that Manbat decided to do his best Cronenberg impression when he tried to murder everyone. Constantine then says that Khaled managed to find an injection that got him back to something close to human, but you can see it in his eyes. He's under a mystic influence, some form of evil magic, just short of possession. Their best bet is going to be keep him knocked out or he might try to kill everyone again. Kent says that with the Alized first edition, they should be able to help him. Satana looks around and then asks where's Swamp Thing and Bobo reaches into his pocket, pulling out what's left of Swamp Thing, stating, uh, our old pal is a small bit of mush at the moment. He was on the hunt and then he started screaming and then he rotted away to this. Bobo turns and asks, Wonder Woman, that if this is the case, they may want to inform the rest of the Justice League. Things are starting to get a bit out of hand for this group of magic wielders. Cersei stares at the diamond and asks, what now? Bobo then yells, our friends are out of commission and there's no telling who's next. For all we know, Swamp Thing is dead, Wonder Woman. Cersei continues to look at the diamond's glow, stating that it's such a pity to lose a powerful ally like Swamp Thing. They're going to need to make up for it. Perhaps they can call Jason Blood. He's very powerful isn't he? Bobo turns and leaves telling her, right, I'll get right on that. But as he goes, he whispers to Zatanna that he's uh, gonna need her for a sec to get a hold of Jason. 
As Zatanna follows, she begins to ask why he would, but Bobo stops her, telling her, you need to bind Wonder Woman, like right now. Make it so she can't move or speak until we get her wrapped up in that damn lasso. Whatever came out of that basement with you is not Wonder Woman. I just told her the Swamp Thing might be dead, and her reaction was to say that it was a pity to lose a powerhouse. She's not even looked at Man Bat once. Zatanna says that they're all under a lot of, but Bobo cuts her off, telling her, no, I screw up a lot of things. This is not one of those. We are under attack and we are already losing. As Cersei smiles, looking at the diamond, Satana looks back at her and says, Zereth. Cersei begins to laugh. <laughs> that is such a peculiar sort of magic. I always did like the way it sounded on your father's lips. How about this? Eklat, rat, hudium? But before Zatanna can say another word, her mouth is removed. And Bobo sighs. Oh, hell. He calls up for everyone to get away. Cersei is here! Cersei is! But she waves her hand, casting a spell, stating that she doesn't need to talk backward to do her work. Some spells come naturally. As the spell finishes, Bobo is reverted back to his primal state, unable to speak and stripped of all of his knowledge. Kent and the remaining casters gather, and Kent says that she is powerful, but not powerful enough to stop all of us. She bursts out laughing, stating, <laughs> Of course I am! And I am far from alone. And as she says this from the ground arise, Solomon Grundy, Clarion the Witch Boy, Woodrow, and Papa Midnight walk out. With Cersei catching everyone off guard, Zatanna takes a small dagger out of her coat and begins to cut an opening for her mouth. Before Cersei could react, Calypso's diamond vanishes and is brought back into the vault. Zatanna jumps to her feet, telling Kent that they need to get back inside. They cannot fight out here. Without speaking, Kent casts his spell, and the Justice League Dark vanishes. And back in the collective unconsciousness, Wonder Woman says that she needs to find a way back home. Witchfire lights another cigarette, stating that the last time that she was here, Hecate was able to free her. Now, though, things aren't looking so good, but hey, at least it can't get any worse, right, Wonder Woman? The voice then tells her, Oh, I don't know about that. The upside down man puts his hands together and tells her, it can always get worse. My, my Wonder Woman, what a mess you've gotten yourself into. As Wonder Woman struggles to free herself from the swarming other kind, the beings that she was hoping to stop, the upside down man goes on telling her, I've been learning more and more about your world and your people. I thought it would be a simple transaction. The Lord of Order, Naboo, offered your world, but stolen their power and let it grow without them for over a millennia. But then Cersei came and offered me the same deal. I saw the rivet, of course. I could feel the hunger of power emanating from her like a burning heat. Can you imagine it, negotiating with something that can eat gods and lying to that something's face? Wonder Woman yells that if he's going to kill her, then get it over with. And the upside down man laughs a bit, telling her, No, no, I enjoy playing with my food. Cersei made me a deal, and now I would like to offer you a deal, a double cross. Isn't it marvelous? So tell me, what are you willing to offer me for the ultimate destroyer? Back in the vault, Kent shows an image from the outside and Constantine asks if that's Dracul Carfang. Was that the giant dragon skeleton that they hung up in the place now brought back to life? Bobo begins to panic seeing the dragon and as he runs away, Khaled says, okay, we're going to need someone else to deal with the angry chimpanzee. As Zatanna walks away, Constantine follows stating that that was quite the knife trick. Are you feeling okay? Satana heals her wound, telling him decidedly no. Cersei is too powerful, and it's only a matter of time before she breaks the doors to the vault down. If she gets her hands on Eclipso's diamond, it's over. And Calypso from the gem begins to laugh. Oh, you're all going to die. Satana looks back at Constantine, asking if he has a trick up his sleeve for this, that he and her father conspired for these exact events to happen. Please tell her that this is the moment for some horrible John Constantine trick. Constantine takes a puff of a cigarette and exhales, stating, I do, but I can't say it's a clever one. We're locked up in the armory. Half of these artifacts have brought the Justice League to their knees at one point or another, so what if we use them? Calypso begins to laugh, telling him, Yes! Listen to the idiot man! Cut yourself! Free Calypso, do it! Back at the collective unconsciousness, Wonder Woman sits in a small box filled with all sorts of bugs, stating, You're angry, aren't you? 
You want to be this infallible thing, this creature of horror, but you simply are a dark mirror of Hecate magic. If her magic has every incredible possibility, then you are a very terrible one. You were her opposite and she hated you. You should have been one, but you were sealed away and you were never meant to exist in this universe, upside down man. So this is what I have to offer. I can fix you, make you what you were meant to be. I will find a way to make you whole. The upside down man bursts out laughing. <laughs> you want to fix me? I'm going to eat the world. That's what I want. You're a terrible negotiator. As the upside down man turns the bugs into fire, Wonder Woman goes on stating, I am offering you much more than that and you know it. There must be a balance, there has to be a possibility. The upside down man asks, what if there's not? And Wonder Woman tells him, if I can't fix you, I won't stand in your way. The upside down man releases Wonder Woman from the cube stating, fine, I will give you a body back. I will give you the means to tap into all of that magical power that has ever lived inside of you. You will stop the witch goddess's ascension and you will find a means to bring balance. And if you fail, I will eat all of the magic alive. But just to show that I'm not lying, the upside down man fades away and reappears grabbing witch fire from behind. Wonder Woman yells, that, that is not a part of the deal. And the upside down man opens up his gaping mouth, biting into a piece of her neck stating, it wasn't not a part of the deal. As he lets go, Wonder Woman tries to catch Witchfire's body, but he tells her to wake up. She needs to hurry up. Time is running out. Back in the vault, Carfang the dragon breaks down on the vault doors and Cersei begins to lead her team in. Kent and Zatanna try to hold them back with Bobo and Manbat out of commission. And while that goes on, Khalid decides to speak with someone. He tells Nabu, the being inside of the Dr. Fate helmet, that he has saved the universe more times than anyone can count. He believes in right and wrong, and if they lose this battle, they will lose anything. But he can help them win this. It is time to show all of magic a new fate. As the booming sounds get louder outside of the vault, Eclipso begins to laugh, yelling, She's here! <laughs> Constantine says that Cersei wants them to hear her coming. If she frees Eclipso by destroying the diamond, there won't be any way to contain him unless he's inside one of them. So Constantine begins to reach for the diamond, but Zatanna slaps him, telling him, we need to find another way. We just can't give in that easily. Outside, Cersei gets ready to break down the vault door, stating that it is time to end this. But before she does, a voice tells her, no. Cersei spins around asking, who? Who said that? And everyone else looks at each other stating that they didn't. And then the voice rings out again in Cersei's mind telling her, I said it. Cersei of Colchis, it is time you paid for your sins. You have sought your supremacy at a great cost. Your actions led Hecate, mother of all magic, to destruction and set her power against the world. As the three beings walk out, Cersei looks at them yelling, no, that is not possible. Wonder Woman stands as her Witchmark version, as well as her Chaos Magic version, stating, nothing is impossible. And all three Wonder Womans begin to bind Cersei as she shouts that this is a trick. This is some kind of illusion. Wonder Woman does not have this kind of strength. The Witchmarked Wonder Woman pulls on her lasso, stating that she knows nothing of true strength. Cersei begins to fight back, stating that she is the queen of life and death now. If they haven't noticed, she also has a dragon. Carfang roars, stating, it is time for the Amazon to pay. Wonder Woman looks to the dragon and states that she must forgive her, but she is merely an echo of a forlong vanquished dragon, and it is time for her to go back to sleep. With one hit, Carfang begins to devolve into coins. And while the witch-marked Wonder Woman and Chaos Magic Wonder Woman hold Cersei, Cersei begins calling out to her new allies, but nothing happens. Wonder Woman tells her that they will not listen to her. She merely frightened them into an alliance, and now they see her as weak, and they will not serve her. Cersei begins to panic, stating that her Injustice League, but the witch-marked Wonder Woman laughs, stating that Clarion the Witch Boy has taken Solomon Grundy and vanished. He saw where the tide was turning. Wonder Woman then asks Pomp of Midnight, does he not wish to stand against her? Does he not sense the power that she now wields? Pomp of Midnight holds his hands up, stating, I, uh, yield and Woodrow follows suit. Cersei screams at them, cowards, you are all cowards. Wonder Woman then floats down before Cersei asking, when will she learn that she cannot find power through spite alone? Hatred kills Hecate and it will kill her too if she lets it. Cersei scoffs telling her, you first. 
And inside of the vault, Eclipso senses the shift in the battle and acts. The black diamond bounces off the walls, cutting through the side of Wonder Woman's arm. Cersei stands back, gathering her strength, yelling that it does not matter what power you hold, it cannot bind Eclipso! Wonder Woman falls to her knees and begins to laugh, laughing just like Eclipso. Zatanna shouts that she has controlled this power before. She must fight it. So she stands up yelling that she did so only with the help of everyone. Eclipso was created to eat away and negate Hecate's power. She cannot stop him alone. But at that moment, a voice calls out that she is not alone. A beaten and broken Kent Nelson looks up stating, No, Khaled, what have you done? And Khaled rockets through with Nabu stating, My young host has shown me that there is still work to do to contain chaos in this world. He has ceded control to the helmet, granting him my power. Khaled calls out that he is the one in control. He is Dr. Fate now. As Khaled punches through and frees Wonder Woman, he tells her that he can hold her mind in place and keep Eclipso dormant long enough for her to act, but she needs to fix this. Wonder Woman picks herself up asking, how? And Khaled uses the help of the other two Wonder Women and says that she has more power than any god that has ever walked this earth. She needs to order that magic. Start small, fix what is broken. She concentrates, telling them that they will start with Carfang, returning her to the pedestal. And the walls of the fortress are healed. Bobo and Man Bat's mind are restored and Swamp Thing, she, she cannot reach him. Kala tells her that he is a problem for another day. Focus, Wonder Woman! She continues stating that Cersei is so powerful, her rage so great. She could be such a force for good in this world. I wish I could make her see it. That's it. I understand what I must do. And in a flash, Cersei looks around and finds herself in the collective unconsciousness, asking how. Wonder Woman walks through the waterfall, holding an orb, stating that this is the power that she sought to wield and she can have it. Cersei looks at the light, asking, you are lying. And Wonder Woman tells her that this isn't a lie. When has she ever lied? Cersei then asks, why would you give me the power? And Wonder Woman places her hand on Cersei's shoulder, stating that she told herself that she was weak because she lacked this power. But there is something deeper in her that must heal. She will give her what is desired and give her time for those wounds to heal. She will not be able to wield this magic against the world, but she will hold it within her and keep it safe. And in time, if she can convince her, perhaps they can save magic together. Cersei smacks Wonder Woman's hand away, stating that she will not help people. She will always double cross them. She will always hate her. Wonder Woman holds out the orb, stating that they will just have to see. And as Cersei is sealed in a painting, Zatanna then asks if that was really the best move. Wonder Woman explains that Cersei is contained using a fabrication of the Black Diamond of Eclipso in the nth metal of Dr. Fate's helmet. She wished to become Hecate Reborn, the moon, a mirror to all of magic. As Constantine lights Bobo's cigarette, Bobo says that they have a new, highly dangerous magical artifact to keep track of, the painting of Cersei. First person to ask, who's the fairest of them all is going to get strangled? But are they going to be doing anything about that rogue elemental that maybe killed Swamp Thing? Woodrow begins to back away, stating that they don't have to, but Khaled binds him, stating, I will handle it. Kent Nelson says that he really hopes that there was a consideration for this action. And Khaled tells him that he didn't think that they could do this without Naboo's help. They need Dr. Fate. Manbat stands up, rubbing his head, asking if he ate anybody. He is terribly sorry. Constantine lights his own cigarette, seeing Papa Midnight leaving, asking, And where are you going? Papa Midnight stumbles over his words, stating, Well, it, it just seemed like it was all well. Constantine tells him that he isn't volunteering for long, but let's just say that he isn't letting him out of his sight until he tells him something worth leaving him alone. Satana examines the portrait, stating that this is good magic. Her father would be impressed. It was such a beautiful move to have that much trust. And Wonder Woman closes her eyes, stating that it was not the only reason. While she was trapped in the collective unconsciousness, the upside down man came to her. She made a deal with him, a dark deal. And she fears that her father was right all along that she may have just doomed everyone. In the offices of Waters and Williamson in Los Angeles, studio executive Martin Sellis comes in today a changed man. He strolls through the lobby with something growing on his head. An office worker sees the fungus and says that it's really cool makeup, but Martin turns and releases a gas in his face. 
As Martin leaves the elevator, the worker slumps to the ground, withering in pain as he too now has mushrooms sprouting from his head. As Martin makes his way to the roof, he feels compelled to tell the world something. Something only he could say. He stands atop there, catching the attention of the passing by animal man, Buddy Baker. As everyone gathers to watch what Martin is going to do, his head explodes, releasing the spores from the growth into the air. And a short while later, while Wonder Woman and Bobo attempt to contain the spread, Buddy tells them that this is a cordyceps infection. Bobo says, a what? And Buddy explains that it's a fungus that has taken over their minds and is now using their bodies to propagate itself. It's never infected humans before, never anything at this rate as well. Wonder Woman holds back some of the infected, stating that it seems like they're all marching towards something. What could it be? Buddy tells her, probably something tall. And once they're high up, the growths will explode and further spread the infection. Bobo yells that the infected just want to go somewhere high, then they're wasting their time on the ground. And there's only one building that they could be heading to. The three rush over to the tallest building, and they begin to barricade the doors as Buddy says that he felt a change in the red when this all started. The lines are being crossed. The balance is shifting. It's the parliaments. They're at war. We have to find the other guardians. The guardians of the green, the red, the blue, and the black. Bobo says that they have the Floronic Man as a prisoner at the Hall of Justice, so that only leaves one other that will work with them. But as Buddy reaches to the back of his neck, he feels some of those spores beginning to grow. Meanwhile, over at the Hall of Justice, Zatanna and Kent begin to try and track down the source of the infection as Khaled confers with Nabu for insight. Nabu tells him that they are the cause of all of this, all of them, and their naive need for chaos. Khaled calmly tells him that chaos is just as much a part of the world as order. Magic is healing itself. There are bound to be a few hiccups. They have been through this before. Help them understand what is going on. Help them bring order to the chaos. After a short moment of pulling the helmet on, Khaled returns to the others and says that it's the parliaments. They're all fighting each other for dominance. Nabu says that there's only one way to bring back the balance. And it begins with the dawn of humanity and the lords of order. The Lords set forth an ancient rite that will convene with the forces that have infused the natural world with power. The green, the red, the gray, the divided, and the rot. The ritual must be conducted once again. They must convene the parliaments of life. Back in the shadows, a lighter is struck and John Constantine lights his cigarette asking, and what's the catch? There's always a catch, squire. Some terrible price, some dreaded cost. Always tattooed on the devil's, well, you know. Khaled says that he must leave to prepare for the ritual, and once they have gathered the guardians, they will call upon them. John laughs, stating that all they have to do is convince their enemy, an unwilling prisoner, to cooperate. Sounds easy enough, mates. Later, down in the vaults of the Hall of Justice, Woodrow sits in his magic prison, stating that he's beginning to feel that he's going to get visitors today. John asks if he's finding the new accommodations all right, getting enough compost. They've been watering it down here, Woodrow? Woodrow lashes out, but the magical barrier stops him, and John tells him to relax. Zatanna asks if he knows anything about what's happening, and Woodrow tells her that it's all they're doing. They unleash the forces beyond all knowing, and the Parliament trust no one anymore. Their balance is broken, and they each fight for their own survival and strength, and now they want something from him. Well, set him free, and he will help. Woodrow lashes out with the magical barrier stops him and John tells him to relax. Satana asks if he knows anything about what's happening and Woodrow tells her that it's all they're doing. You watched the Parliament of Trees burn. Then you changed the rules by which magic works with all of your meddling. You've unleashed forces beyond all knowing and the Parliament trusts no one anymore. The balance is broken. You each fight for your own survival and strength. And now you want something from me. Well, set me free and I will help. Zatanna scoffs, telling him that they won't be freeing him, and John says that they don't have time to play by the rules here. They're going to have to compromise. Zatanna stops him. No, that's how he does things. Compromises, deals, bargains. It's why we're here in the first place. It's why my father is. John quietly stares, and Zatanna says that Diana bought them some time to set things right. She isn't going to waste that by creating more problems. They'll find the other guardians, and then they'll deal with Woodrow. And for the record, she is the one calling the shots, so no deals, we're going to go find Abigail. John laughs as he flicks his cigarette onto the floor 
and he leaves. But as the doors to the vault shut, the smoke from the cigarette begins to grow and John steps out through it. He smiles, telling Woodrow that Z can get a little emotional. But we can be adults about this, right, Woodrow? So how about we strike a deal? You do exactly what you're told to do and when you're told to do it, and you'll be able to walk out of here at the end of all of this. Woodrow asks how he would be able to do that without the others knowing, and John says, oh, I'll manage. Don't you worry about that. But as John leaves, a small fly buzzes in, landing on Woodrow's finger. It begins to melt away, stating, Woodrow, before finally dripping to the ground. The black goop begins to grow, and a deep, dark voice comes out of it, stating, Constantine will betray you. Woodrow scoots back, yelling, I didn't tell him anything! And the voice says, Good, and our arrangement still holds true. It may be difficult to be trapped here, but soon you will be free and you will get your revenge. Soon after, John and Zatanna head to Luton Reformatory with a lead to find Abigail. But as they get to the entrance, they see a large growth of rot covering it. John pulls out a small key stating that this is how they're going to find Abigail Arcane within the rot. John wraps the long chain of the key around both his and Zatanna's neck, and Zatanna begins to state that what she said earlier, it isn't right. John laughs, stating that he can be a real piece of work sometimes, but with Houdini's key, they'll be able to get the answers that they're looking for. John then takes out the small key, putting it into the lock of the building, but instead of opening up the reformatory's lobby, it opens up the much darker room with death and decay. John tells her, Voila! Welcome to the heart of the rot Z. Back in LA, Buddy holds back a horde of infected, and Bobo yells that this isn't working. Being defensive about this isn't going to win them anything. But he tells them, well, they can't very well attack. They are people that are infected with a mushroom virus. But there is something that we could try. We're going to need some time to get started, though. Wonder Woman tightens the braces on her shield, telling him that whatever his plan is, they only have one shot at it. Make it count. When Wonder Woman gets to work, Buddy sends out a call, jumping into the mind and body of a creature that lies within himself. Swimming inside of his gut, among the vial of his intestine, to the lowly helmet, the microscopic flatworm. Meanwhile, over at the heart of the rot, John and Z look around for any clues when they notice a vine growing in the midst of the rot. John says that this is the Ayahuasca vine, and Z asks if it's the stuff that the Yorina shamans use for divining and projecting things. John takes a bit of the vine goo and tastes it. Then he jumps to his feet, yelling, It works! I know how to find Abigail! Z says that she isn't going to like this, is she? And John begins ripping up the vines, chowing down on them, stating, Things are about to get real weird, Z. Just do me a favor and keep them from getting to me, yeah? A fleshy rot creature begins to spew forth, coming at them, and John crawls up into a small hole, stating, I'll be right back. And Zatanna says that she isn't holding her breath. While she begins to battle, John pulls himself into a different realm, falling flat onto his back. He gets up, peering over into the nearby swamp and sees the white-haired Abigail walking in and Swamp Thing emerging. The two embrace, but Abigail from the rot hoped that things wouldn't be like everything else, but it was. With his simple touch, Swamp Thing's body begins to decompose and pieces fell off. All that was left was his bones, and those bones would pull her into the depths below. She felt as though she was drowning, and then, with an outstretched hand, John reaches for her. But while John is rescuing Abigail, Z strikes down another creature when she notices something behind her. From the black muck, a body rises, and a voice calls out, You are the child of Giovanni Zatara. I can see why he pinned all of his hopes on you, even as he burns eternally in the other place. The darkness soon takes the form of a man, and the man tells her, The black grows tired of your inadequacies. It whispers once more my name, Anton Arcane. In the Serengeti, though, Khaled descends into a volcano where he meets with those who govern the Order, the avatars of stone flame, waves, and vapor. The Avatar of Stone says that they remember him. He was at the beginning before he called himself Doctor, Pharaoh, or Lord. Khaled says that there was a responsibility handed to them at the dawn of humanity, one that they must keep now. Reconvene the parliaments of life. Return them to a place of balance. The Avatar of Waves asks why must they? Why must they inflict their order upon the natural chaos of this world? The Avatar of Stone says that the world has been in decay long before the Parliament went to war. He witnessed firsthand the fall of order and magic. 
Humankind seems intent on its own destruction. Perhaps this is the natural state, life itself fighting back against an imposed order. Khaled tells them that it must be easy to say such things when people struggle to maintain the balance that should have been the Avatar's responsibility. All the systems have a natural order, without which they must necessarily fall to violent consequences. The parliaments themselves realize this, and even they are at war. Even as they speak, the Guardian of the Red sees aid from the Divided, a parliament of unseen life that populates this world. And over inside Buddy's body, Buddy calls out through the flatworm that he knows that they are there, and he has come to ask for help. As Buddy waits, the cells begin to swirl around and a large creature with no eyes forms, stating, Baker, speak. The divided, listen. Buddy tells them that the gray attacked the red. They know this to be true. The divided has to help them. The divided says, always death, always consequence, always the divided survive. But he goes on stating, yeah, but the humans won't. The divided will lose a whole species that they've colonized. Soon after, the animals will disappear. And if all the living life is gone, the divided won't have a home. After a few moments of silence, a signal goes out. The spores growing in the infected's heads soon begin to fall off. And Bobo asks, what's going on? But he groans as he stands back up, stating that it worked. He reached out to the Divided, convinced the bacteria in their bodies to fight off the fungal infection. Bobo asks, There's a parliament of bacteria? As in germs? Back in the Serengeti, Khaled projects an image of Buddy's triumph asking the avatars. See? Parliaments aiding parliaments to even out the size of the conflict. Life seeks balance, correction, order! The avatars all state that they only see desperate attempts to cling to order for a few moments longer. All balances engineered this way are destined to decay. Meanwhile, in the heart of the rot, Zatanna is bound by Anton as he tells her that she cannot harm him. Not here, not in this place. He is a part of the seething putric fabric here. Here, he is God, and he will not be compromised again within his own walls. As Anton slams Zatanna down, the rot slowly seeps into her mouth to silence her, but Anton notices something. He quickly turns his back, blocking the hole where John climbed into, yelling, She must not be allowed to wake! Before Zatanna passes out, she manages to cast a spell, Write My Name in the Sky. Just outside of the reformatory, John pulls Abigail out of the lake and she coughs, asking who is he? Does she know him? John straightens his hair, telling her, Not yet, you don't. But you will in a few years, and I'd rather not spoil the surprise. Abigail pauses for a moment and says, You're friends with Alec Holland, aren't you? He pulls out a wet cigarette, sighing. I'm not sure that's how Alec would see it, but we don't have a lot of time. The world around us is falling apart, and you've been trapped in your own dreams. I came here to find you, and I'm going to take a guess that whoever put you here doesn't want you waking up. Abigail then asks, Where is Alec? Why didn't Swamp Thing come to get her? John tells her, Alec here. He would have torn the worlds apart to find you if you were still here. Your name is the last thing he spoke. Abigail begins to cry and John yells that they don't have a lot of time. The rot is not her enemy. She can't run from death and loss. If she wants to wake up, she's going to have to embrace it. Moments later in the real world, a blast is fired at Anton and John crawls back stating that he really hates the smell of singed rot. Anton says that he felled the child of Giovanni. Must he contend with the parlor trickster now? John last stating that everyone is a bloody critic. But don't fret, I've brought a friend. Abigail steps up yelling that she thought she was rid of him. And Anton stares at Abigail stating that she is his greatest creation and his greatest betrayer. She turned on him, conspired with the green, with Alec Holland. He is taking back what was once his. She will never be rid of him. He is the rot that infects her memories. And back over in the Serengeti, the avatars tell Khaled that they are done speaking with him. There is no need for them to be involved. Kala takes off the helmet, telling them to wait. You need humans! The Avatar Stone asks how so, and Kala tells him that he is a man standing before them, not a god, not a lord, not a sorcerer. He must remind him that he is just a man. They have power over the natural magic of this world, but humans, they have stories. Without them, magic wouldn't exist. You were primal forces once, but once you were told stories, you were made in our image. Without us, the avatars would undoubtedly not exist. You would have no reason, no purpose. You are powerful, but you hold power over nothing. Are the stories of humans not worth saving? 
The Avatar stopped to listen to his words, but then the Avatar of Stone says that perhaps there is some truth in what he says. And back in the heart of the rot, the forces of darkness gathered to bring Abigail down. However, there was someone making their way into the fray, and that someone is Wonder Woman. Anton quickly begins to absorb all of his creatures into himself, and Abigail lunges into attack. Wonder Woman calls out asking if she can fight Anton's control over the rot, and Abigail tells her that she can try, but she'll only be able to see him for a moment. Wonder Woman grabs her sword, stating that a moment is all she needs to end this. Abigail braces herself with Anton, and Wonder Woman rushes forward, cutting through the giant fleshy body, ripping Anton out of its center. Wonder Woman tells him that she knows that she cannot kill him here, but at the very least, this is going to hurt. Anton hisses that she doesn't know what he is capable of. And what is to come? Well, she knows even less. And within Wonder Woman's grasp, Anton's body begins to fester as bugs begin to flee from him and his body begins to fade away. As the swarm flies off, Abigail yells that she can follow, but John tells her to wait. They have to let him go for now. They have to help Z. Later, with Anton gone, Abigail saved and Wonder Woman being the hero, we move back to the medical bay of the Justice League Dark Headquarters. Abigail states that Z has been purged of the rot, but she needs to rest. John tells her not to worry. Z is tougher than she looks. She'll be back up in no time. He's going to need something from her, though. Between the two of them, there's something bigger at play, and he's going to need her to trust him. Shortly after, Kent tells everyone that they have opened the portal and everything is ready, and they're going to need to take their prisoner. John laughs, lighting his cigarette, stating, don't fret. He'll make sure Woodrow has been well taken care of, and as he heads into the vault, Woodrow scrambles to get up, explaining himself. But John tells him to shut up and listen. He knows it was him, the vine in the rot, the one that put Abigail into her dreams. It came from him. But they found her. Z is hurt, and Wonder Woman is very angry. No telling what she'll do. She found out that he was the one who did it. Woodrow looks away, asking, what do you want? John takes a drag of his cigarette, stating that at the ritual, he is going to be a good little petal and do exactly as he's told. A short while later, the guardians are brought into the mountains and Khaled tells them that they will begin the rite. It began when the Parliament of Trees was first burned. Old alliances were broken, lines that were crossed. But this covenant, this is the oldest of them all. They are bound by it to keep the balance of life, death, and magic in this world. For this, all the guardians must give up their powers willingly. Do they accept? John pushes Woodrow forward, telling him that he's up, and Woodrow pushes back, yelling, No! John releases the magic, binding Woodrow, whispering, This is the deal. You do this and you can walk away. Now go on, break a leg. Khaled begins the process and saps the power out of Woodrow, and within seconds, he falls to the ground a normal human. Next, Buddy steps up, transferring his power over the red, and then finally, Abigail transfers her power over the rot. John nods to her, and Abigail walks up, stating that she's sorry but this is for Alec. Abigail's rot spreads into the Parliament of Flowers and they begin to cry out in pain. And then finally is Abigail of the rot. John nods and Abigail walks up pretending she's going to give up her powers, but she states out loud that she is sorry. But this is for Alec. Her rot spreads into the Parliament of Flowers and they begin to cry out in pain. Woodrow screams for them to stop what they're doing, but as the green turns into a black puddle of goop, Wonder Woman grabs Abigail, asking what has she done, and John reaches in. The Parliament's all lash out, but as Wonder Woman looks back, she sees John reaching for something. He pulls out a small seed, stating that he is sorry, but he swears he couldn't have thought of another way. As the volcano erupts, John runs outside with his key to escape, but inside of the mountain, Buddy grabs Abigail, asking, why did you do this? She tells him that it was John, he has a plan. And over in the Louisiana swamps, John stumbles, yelling, We don't have much time. Anton steps out, stating that he's done something. The parliament, something changed, something is in an uproar. Why are you here, Constantine? John tells him the same reason as him. Stories go in circles, don't they? We're just going back to where it all began, to catch up with an old friend. Anton says that he didn't think of them as friends, and John looks over, telling him, Actually, I was talking to someone else. Through the weeds, Swamp Thing stands up. I remember this place. Anton yells, this can't be. How did Swamp Thing back? What did you do, Constantine? And John says that it was only a seed. Abby attacked the Parliament of Flowers and caused them to decay. And from the rotting debris, there was a seed. He came here planting that little bit of hope into the ground. And well, this happened. Swamp Thing smiles. The trees, they're growing in the green again. 
John glares back at Anton, saying that he knows that there's no way that he would have wormed his way out here without a little help from the Upside Down Man. And Anton's snare is telling him, The Upside Down Man is coming back. You are nothing but playthings to him. Swamp Thing then stares at Anton. I remember you, and you have meddled enough. As the vines wrap around Anton, Anton shouts that it is impossible to stop him. But Swamp Thing says that the rot stands with him no more. He is returned, and with him the balance restored. The parliaments have struck a bargain for peace. As the vines continue to wrap and form around Anton, Swamp Thing looks at his hand, stating that he has Alec Holland's memories, but he knows of Sorrel and so many more. He feels like an old thing, an ancient. But John laughs, telling him, No, old friend. You're going to be something entirely new. But unfortunately, I've most likely lost my consulting privileges at the Hall of Justice. So this is where we part ways. Swamp Thing returns to the Hall of Justice, reuniting with Abigail, and as they do, Zatanna continues to slumber. But in her dreams, something changes, and she begins to fall. She feels as if she is drowning in an ocean of darkness, and glimmering right before her, she can see teeth. The Upside Down Man says that the trouble with drowning in the darkness, you never quite know which way is up. And at that moment, Zatanna gasps for air as she wakens into the world. As the weeks go by, Wonder Woman stands atop of a building, looking out at the city, when Bobo walks out stating that she is a hard person to find. She tells him that maybe she didn't want to be found, and Bobo asks when is she coming back, back to Justice League Dark. She sighs, stating that she isn't sure. Everything seemed to fall apart last time. Zatanna got hurt. John left because of his secrets. They needed a teenager to make an argument for human life, and a man bat just got back from the hospital. She's beginning to wonder if she led this team astray. Bobo lights a cigarette. Yeah, and I'm a chimp with a magical sword that doesn't even work the way it's supposed to. How am I supposed to feel? Wonder Woman asks, how is everyone anyway? And Bobo asks, how do you think? Untethered, rudderless. Z came into the bar a few days ago, and ever since John took off, she's been a wreck. Came in to pick up some stuff obtained from a black market operator. Needless to say, kind of trashed the bar. But the scary part, her reaction was nothing. No sympathy or gratitude. A thanks would have been nice, but yeah. Now, normally I don't butt into people's affairs, but I'm a detective and a chimp. That's twice the normal amount of curiosity. Whatever Zatanna is doing, she's keeping it real secret. So I went to go to Man Bat to see if we could talk Z out of whatever she's planning on doing. But after explaining everything to him, he's way more interested in whatever he's working on. Turns out Swamp Thing is not only Swamp Thing, he also has living things inside of him, external organisms. Something about the green being aided by the other parliaments. There was one last place that he went before coming here, and that's when I went to go check on the two Dr. Fates, Kent Nelson and Khaled. But it sounded like Kent was stepping back and that they had to work out some of the Dr. Fate details. Bobo takes another drag from his cigarette and he asks, Do you see why they act the way they do? You're worried about the consequences your choices might have for those around you, so you're off here, alone. You're afraid of whether you could live with us. And not that it's any of my business, but it's probably going to be harder to not make those choices. That's why we need you. You can take it. You can carry the burden of making those choices. I'd follow you into the heart of the abyss without a blink, Wonder Woman. But you have to be unafraid for the rest of us. Later, at the theater, Zatanna yells in frustration after another failed attempt to reach her father. And as she closes her eyes, she feels a hand touching her shoulder. Wonder Woman helps Zatanna up and hugs her, telling her that she is sorry. She is sorry that she let it get to this. As Zatanna tells her that she doesn't understand. But Wonder Woman goes on stating that Hecate and the Upside Down Man were manifested from the same source of magic. This world and the other place both formed in their image, mirroring each other. With a piece of Hecate's soul still within her, Wonder Woman is the key to the other place. Bobo says, oh, so we're doing this, right? Getting everyone back together? Taking the fight to the Upside Down Man? Wonder Woman walks over and kneels down telling him, No, I and Zatanna will go. I need to know that there's still a line of defense should we not return. Khaled is our last hope, and if Kent Nelson is leaving as he says, Khaled will need someone by his side. There's no one else I trust more than you, Bobo. Bobo laughs, I'm a chip with a magical sword, but yeah, you can count on me. And right now it's time to get off the sidelines and do something. Bobo steps back as Zatanna teleports them away, but as he's watching, he thinks to himself, You know, she's wrong. 
She does need our help. Bobo then takes out a note, stating, Bobo, if you find yourself a patron short at the bar, here's how you can find me. J.C. On the other side of the portal, Wonder Woman is a ton of float into the other place, and Wonder Woman says that it's like this place is just magic, untethered and wild. Zatanna yells that she can see someone up ahead, and the two float towards that light. And as they get closer to it, Zatanna yells, Is that my father? She reaches out asking, Do you remember me? I came for you. Giovanni Zatara speaks as he walks forward, telling her that she, you should not have come. He falls to his knees, screaming out in agony as his body is torn asunder. Through the smoke, a voice calls out. Now, now, Giovanni, you wouldn't want to deprive me of this, would you? The upside down man walks out, stating, I have waited so long to face her here, in this place. Zani yells to let her father go, that she is the one that he wants. But the upside down man says, shh, as he places his finger to his lips. Zatanna tries to move, but her body begins to turn to dust, and it gets swept up in the swirling winds. The Upside Down Man then calls out to Wonder Woman, stating, You are Hecate's chosen and marked. You failed. You have no answers for me. And now you come here seeking your own death, to spare you the sight of your world being devoured by me. Wonder Woman tells him that she is here to ask for another bargain. But without a thought, the Upside Down Man says, I refuse! Why would I bargain for which I can take so easily? As the ground breaks around her and it swallows up Wonder Woman, she breaks free shouting, Because I am Diana of Themyscira, princess of the Amazons, and am marked by Hecate. I have watched over this world longer than you have coveted it. Wonder Woman throws her sword, stating that there is one thing that she has learned in that time, and it's that people. But the upside down man catches the sword and he responds by firing a power beam out of his mouth. Before the beam can hit Wonder Woman, Zatanna casts a spell to shield her and Wonder Woman finishes it by stating, people can surprise you when you least expect it, upside down man. Zatanna points her fingers, pew pew, and fires her own beam, ripping into the side of the upside down man's head. He rubs the side of his face. Interesting, the way you speak your words. In this place, they give your magic greater strength. Zatanna steps forward, stating that her father taught her to speak like that. She used to wonder why, and now she understands and remembers everything. The two begin to shoot beams of magic back and forth, with Zatanna yelling that they can't keep doing this. They need to do something. Wonder Woman says that the Upside Down Man wants her. She should take her father and find a way back, but Zatanna stops her, telling her, I am not leaving you! The Upside Down Man says, Do you think that you can beat me? You still cannot think of this beyond your simplest struggles. You cannot beat magic itself! Here, I am limitless infinite, and I take shapes so that your small minds can even comprehend me! But long since Hecate imprisoned me here, I have infiltrated and affected this empty void of space. She is the reality of the other place, don't you see? There is no limit to what I can do. What I can be for. <laughs> As the very fabric of reality begins to shatter to pieces, vines grow out, wrapping around the upside down man, pulling things back together. Swamp Thing's voice echoes, stating, You have infested this place with your own reality. It is possible for another to invade yours. The battle of magic is a battle of realities and a contest of will, and the will of the green bears heavy upon me. Even here... With a thundering crackoom, a giant Swamp Thing crushes the Upside Down Man between his palms. Swamp Thing tells Wonder Woman that the Upside Down Man is still very powerful, but this is how they will defeat him, by changing the very reality of his universe. He will not be held for long, but they have time. Wonder Woman asks time, to what end? And Swamp Thing tells her, time for the rest of us, to each find our own answers. Through a puff of smoke, Bobo steps into the dark London night, and he says, Okay, follow the instructions. This should be it. You better be here, Constantine. He opens up a door to a pub, and he calls out to John, but inside, there are floating tarot cards, and John Constantine is strung up and gagged by them upside down. Bobo walks in with his sword, telling them that he's not entirely sure what the hell is going on, but he went through a lot looking for John. So he's going to have to go through them to get John out. Then that's how it's going to be. 
A woman tells Bobo to calm down. He's as much a knight of the swords, right? Decisive, focused. Perhaps he is the one that might bring better tidings to the door than that imbecile. As Madame Zanadu waves her hand, John comes crashing to the ground and she asks, what brings the both of you here? Bobo looks back at John and asks, uh, why are we here again? John gets up rubbing his neck, stating that she knows what they want. She was there with Zatara in the beginning. He knew that this was coming, that there has to be something he told her, anything. How do they win this? Xanadu motions to the tarot cards before her, stating that he knows how this works. Pick a card, John. So John picks up the moon and Xanadu says, ah, that is a card of illusion and intuition. I want to remind you of this, magician. You can make a coin disappear. You can take a rabbit out of a hat. You can saw a lady in half. Is it magic or is it a trick? The trick is always to be learned. It is science, it is a craft, it is a skill. But if it's a trick, where is the magic? Xanadu closes her hands around the card, continuing by stating that the magic is getting people to believe in another reality despite what they know to be true. This is where the magic comes in. As Xanadu opens up her hands, a bird flies out and John laughs. Belief. The two begin to leave and Bobo calls back that he's sorry about all the threats and all that. And Xanadu holds up the deck of cards asking, Aren't you going to pick up your third card? John laughs, stating that they both know what the card is. It's the fool. It's always the fool. And as the door to the pub closes, Xanadu wishes that that were true. As she picks up John Constantine's next card, revealing death. Back at the Hall of Justice, Manbat lifts his glasses, stating that he did it. It's inelegant and rushed, but given the circumstances, it'll suffice. And just in time! Swamp Thing says that he had to have it ready before they returned said that they'd know how to get there. Bobo asks, where is there? And Manbat yells, the other place, of course. Bobo puffs his cigarette, stating, yeah, that ain't happening. Wonder Woman was the key to getting there. She needed a powerful sorcerer like Zatanna to help. What chance do we have of getting over there? Unless. A few moments later, Bobo picks up Dr. Fate's helmet and Khaled says that he's doing it. There's no way to talk him out of it. Bobo tells him, actually, we were looking for Kent. Bobo tosses the helmet back, stating that he made too many of his own mistakes to tell others not to do the same. Just know this. You go in half cocked and short on belief, you're going to get yourself killed. Put that doubt over your head and suit up, Dr. Fate. It's the last march of the backup brigade. Once everyone gathers up, Bobo asks, how are they going to do this? They need a key. So John pulls out Houdini's key, asking, what if I told you that this key was a gift from Giovanni himself? Meanwhile, in the other place, Wonder Woman is looking out at the lush green, stating that this place is beautiful. Swamp Thing tells her that this is the new life, and it is not without death. New light from darkness. Order within chaos. It is the new beginning. Across the way, Zatanna tries to help her father, Giovanni, from his pain, asking how she can release him from his torment, and Giovanni tells her that she cannot. It is the cost that he chose to bear, and he wants her to remember. Remember what he taught her. She will only have a brief moment to do it. Make him believe. And soon the green surrounding the upside down man explodes and he shouts asking, You dare imprison me in my own realm! The upside down man lunges at Wonder Woman, bashing into her shield, yelling that even after all this time, Hecate's hubris still thrives within you. After another hit, Wonder Woman calls to Zatanna and Zatanna attacks, causing another explosion. With the upside down man distracted, the vines from Swamp Thing grow as he says that he will not let him rain more destruction upon our world or this one. You have consumed, but as the vines tighten, the upside down man screams, enough, blowing everyone and everything to the ground. He continues stating that they are incapable of seeing that they have always been on borrowed time. Dozens of eyes begin to open up all over the upside down man's body and he yells that after they've all been turned to dust, he will at last open his eyes upon their world. He will consume every bit of Hecate's benevolent magic that courses through it. But just then there's a thundering vroom as a blinding light shines, destroying everything nearby and through the smoke, John Constantine lights his cigarette stating, must be pretty embarrassing. All this talk about destruction, righteous reprisals, end of the world. Khaled maintains the barrier protecting the heroes and the new arrivals and John goes on. It's almost like you're getting weaker. 
Ever start wondering as to why? It's because of the fundamental truth of magic. It's the reason Giovanni held on for all this time, despite his unending torment. Why Zatanna's magic has more power here? Why I was sent to bring Swamp Thing? Why the Parliament of Life listened to Khaled's words? Why we've all followed Wonder Woman without hesitation or question or doubt? And it's why a noble ape holds his broken sword in defiance without fear. It's because of belief. Soon the upside down man's body begins to pulse as it twists and grows and he says, You are about to find out just how absolute my power is in this place. As monsters begin to crawl out of the upside down man, Zatanna says that no matter how great the magic, it has its limits. There will always be a cost. John steps out of the barrier stating that the upside down man is too stubborn to believe in something. When Hecate looked upon her own dark reflection, so repulsed she was, so utterly convinced in her belief of its abhorrence that her belief created. The upside down man yells that he has had enough of your prattling Constantine. And he fires a beam right through Constantine's chest. Zatanna quickly runs out of the barrier to catch him, and the Upside Down Man asks, Don't you see? This is your end! No glory! No reward! Where is your magic now? Where is your belief? As John lay dying in Zatanna's arms, he coughs up, stating, Yeah, we're just making a few omelets. I said this when we face Eclipso. This is the only kind of magic that I know. Do you really think that we would win without breaking a few eggs? The upside down man laughs asking, do you really think that you are winning, Constantine? John asks, have you not been listening? Our battle is a battle of beliefs. You believe that your magic is infinite. We believe that magic <laughs> has a cost. Even just talking about belief has infected this reality. Couldn't wait to just shut me up, huh? That's how it begins for those who believe in absolute power, their downfall every time without a doubt. Swamp Thing says that he can sense the hold on reality in the location that they are is weakening. It's time, Diana. You know what must be done. Wonder Woman holds up the necklace that Cersei is in, asking, Can you hear me, Cersei? Do you still have Hecate's power? Cersei looks at the magical world that she's created, stating that it is strange to have your thoughts turned into reality. And Wonder Woman says that she will need that power. And Cersei asks, what if this place that you've created ceases to exist? What if all that I've made is gone? Wonder Woman tells her that if she can't win this battle, it will be the case anyway. Do you not understand, Cersei? So a few moments later, as Hecate's power surges through Wonder Woman, she tells the upside down man that he will never threaten her world or any other again. Bobo leaps in with the Nightmaster sword, telling them that this is for Mira and for the friends that they've lost along the way. And Khaled flies in shouting, for magic! And Swamp Thing states, for life itself! As the others take their positions, Wonder Woman charges in, but the upside down man throws himself against Wonder Woman's shield, launching her into the ground. He opens his mouth up wide, rushing in, and while Wonder Woman reaches for her sword, she tells Khaled to bind him. Suddenly, mystical chains appear, wrapping the upside down man up, and Wonder Woman takes the chance to stab into his back. As Khaled concentrates to maintain his hold, Swamp Thing tells Man Bat that it's time to use the device. Khaled won't have long. Man Bat pauses for a moment and states, that he doesn't understand. It still needs a source of biomatter. Without the, and Swamp Thing stops him. You have all that we need. I know what must be done. Man Bat begins to fly up into the air as one of the other kinds latch onto his leg. And Bobo cuts the limb off telling him, do it! Man Bat gets up high enough, letting go of his device, letting it onto Swamp Thing. And Swamp Thing's body begins to fade as life begins to flourish around him. Wonder Woman watches as life spreads and she asks if he can feel it. Swamp Thing has sacrificed his body to create new life where there was none before. They have changed the reality of this place. It is learning for the first time to contend with natural law. She promised that she would reunite him with Hecate's magic in the end and this is what it feels like. The vision of magic yet untainted by her own fears. The upside down man tells her, All I see is the last gasps of the pathetic few standing in my way. All I see is a child who will soon falter. And when you do, 
There won't be any stopping what's to come. Khaled continues to try and maintain his concentration, but soon the overwhelming power knocks him away along with the Dr. Fate helmet. He tells Nabu that he's trying to keep his belief, but he is afraid, afraid that he is not strong enough. Nabu lifts the helmet up, telling him, No, you should be proud. You have done more than your fair share, Khaled. It is time to fix the mistake that was made before. The one that I made back then. Rest now. The helmet floats down onto Kent Nelson's head, and Nabu tells him that the Upside Down Man won't be contained for long, and Kent says, They're not going to hold him. They're going to have to focus everything they have into a single shot, channeled through him. Nabu tells him that that much magic focused through a mortal body, there will be nothing left of Kent but dust. And Kent laughs, fitting the helmet, telling him, That's all we ever are, Nabu. Dust. Given shape, finite time to accomplish something with it. I've had my time and Khaled does not deserve so cruel a fate. Wonder Woman calls back, telling Kent not to hold back anything, even if he has to go through her. Hit him now! Using all of the power of Dr. Fate and the Lords of Order, Kent Nelson fires a concentrated beam of magic through Wonder Woman and into the Upside Down Man, creating a massive explosion. As the dust settles, a disfigured Upside Down Man asks, Is that all you have to offer? Satana looks around, telling him that this can't be all that, and he is still standing. They are broken. They can't lose, not after this. What is she missing? And she begins to think back to all of the events leading up to this moment, everything that has happened, and focuses on the words that her father told her when she was younger. She will have a brief moment when the time is right. Magic is that belief. Magic has always had a cost. And suddenly Zatanna realizes it the cost as the upside down man floats there taunting she walks up stating my body is your body my mind is your mind our thoughts are one as are our actions she reaches out merging with the upside down man when suddenly his body begins to right itself as zatanna fights for control inside the darkness of the upside down man's mind he asks what do you think you're doing and zatanna tells him that out there in the physical realm bodies can be broken Worlds can be made and mended. Magic is manifested as physical violence. And in here, it is a pure battle of wills. Here, in their collective mind, they are truly equals. And here, she can beat him. The upside down man bursts out laughing, telling her, I will show you how gravely mistaken you are. All of her memories begin to pour out while the upside down man begins to devour them. And once there is nothing left in her mind, she begins to fade turning into nothing. Outside, the Upside Down Man is fighting for control over his body until he finally absorbs Zatanna, stating, That was interesting. Wonder Woman scoffs, stating that Zatanna hasn't been beaten yet. Hasn't he noticed? He's still standing the right way up. With her strength, Wonder Woman punches the Upside Down Man in the stomach, shaking loose his hold over Zatanna. Suddenly, he stands back up as if he was bowing after a performance, and inside his mind, it is Zatanna performing in front of a crowded theater. She tells the crowd that she will be performing one of the very first pieces of magic that her father, the great illusionist, Giovanni Zatara, taught her. They have, of course, seen her father perform this trick where he pulls a dead rabbit out of his hat. The audience sits in bereaved silence. The wave of a wand and a few magical words, and voila, the creature is newly brought to life, and it leaps forward. But it is only a trick. False bottoms and holes and tables, rabbits in sleeves. Somewhere underneath it all, there is still a dead rabbit in the dark. No, the true magic is holding the corpse and willing its heart to beat again, to pour belief into those words. Suddenly the blood begins to flow through its veins, life filling the rabbit's lungs. There is always a cost. The world is owed a death and that debt must be paid. She watched as her father bore this cost himself, and she has never used such magic sense. But tonight, she holds a new life in her hand, conjured from nothing, pulled out of the void. And in her heart, she feels it, the cost. What is owed is being taken. Tell me, friends, do you feel it too? At that moment, she begins to regain control of her body, destroying the upside down man to the cost. Bobo asks what is happening, and Wonder Woman says that she did it. Their two minds are in one body. She forced him to experience that magic has a cost. His magic, and so his power, has been proven false. Satana sits up telling Wonder Woman to use Hecate's power, to use her magic. 
and Wonder Woman gets up, leaning in, asking the Upside Down Man if he can hear her. With this, she has kept her word to bring balance. As the Upside Down Man is sealed away, life springs anew in the realm where life did not exist. And Bobo looks at the Nightmaster sword, stating that he thought he lost it while fighting. But this, this looks new, like it's been reforged. Wonder Woman tells him that perhaps it absorbed some of the magic in this place. And if it has tethered itself here, then they already have a new name for this place. Bobo holds up his sword and he yells, New Mira! Man Bat felt the sacrifice that Swamp Thing gave to create this life, and it weighted heavy on him. However, as his studies showed, Swamp Thing is still out there waiting. Though not all things could come back as John continues to lay lifeless. Tana tells Giovanni that she has never stopped looking for him. That she never stopped believing that her father was alive. Giovanni says that he knows. He knew that she would come for him. That he would see her once again. Belief kept him alive all this while. And Zatanna looks down at John asking, Is this her cost? Another lesson to be learned. The loss of John Constantine. Giovanni tells her no. Look at everything that he has put her through. All that pain and hurt. One does not burn the future to bring back the past. The flames that have burned his body have taken much from him. But there is little left yet. The desire to be a father one last time. To wipe the tears just once more from her eyes. And as Giovanni holds Zatanna's face, he casts one final spell. The price has been levied upon him. Let it be born unto me. Giovanni then bows, stating that that was his final trick of the evening. The changing man. Goodbye, Piccola. Remember me, and I will always be with you. As Zatanna watches her father step into nothingness, John places his hand on her shoulder, stating, That's some kind of magic. And later, back home, Zatanna is looking over the city, asking Wonder Woman what's next. Wonder Woman says that that's just it. She doesn't know. Hecate's mark is no longer on her soul, and for the first time in a long time, she feels free. Zatanna tells her, yeah, she knows the feeling. But they'll need her once again before long. A world without its heroes is lost. Wonder Woman hugs Zatanna and tells her, that they will be there to help the world find its way. I hope you guys enjoyed today's full story. On this channel, we re-upload our full stories from the Comic Story and Main channel. That way, if you just only want full stories, you have a channel that delivers those to you. If you enjoyed this, please consider liking and subscribing, and please consider checking out our main channel to see the more up-to-date things. I'll see you guys next time right here.